This happened to me in 2016. But I was having trouble sleeping tonight, and my brain dredged this up from my memories. I had recently moved back to my college town so I could rent an apartment with a friend after a long-term relationship ended. I was doing a lot of job hunting for pretty much anything, as I was pretty desperate for income and unsuccessful with finding work within my career field. I was using multiple job sites, but mostly Indeed because I liked their website feature that helps you track which jobs you've applied for and their status. There were of course some jobs that I applied for on their own website, but I kept track. After a few weeks of searching, I get a call. I don't recognize the number and the area code wasn't familiar, but I pick it up as it might be a job prospect. A woman is on the other end and she says that she's calling to set up an interview as I had applied for their company. The company's name was not something that I remembered applying for. While on the phone with her, I quickly pulled up Indeed on my laptop and looked through all the jobs I had applied for. None matched. I have no idea what this job is, but don't make this apparent on the phone as I've been job searching for weeks and I'm still unemployed. I ask her for the address of the building and write it down. Looking back, I can't remember the name she gave me, but what I do remember was how pushy she was into scheduling the interview for later that evening. I agree to do the interview and thank her, but as I hang up, I get a very bad feeling. Something doesn't seem right. So I Google the phone number and it's not linked to a company. I Google the address and it's also not affiliated with a company. It's from way outside the distance of jobs that I was applying for, almost an hour away from where I live. And I pull up a Google Street View and I can see that the address she gave me is several small rundown buildings with a highway exit in the distance. It looked desolate. I pictured driving myself there around dusk when she scheduled the interview for, and I could physically feel this sensation of dread settling within me. I didn't want to go. I brought all of this up to my roomie, and he said that I might be overthinking it, but if I wasn't comfortable with it, to just not go. I'm so glad I didn't. The more time passes, the more I am aware of just how shady it was. In hindsight, I wish that I had gone to the police, but I didn't at the time, because the year prior I hadn't had much faith in them, as I tried to get a restraining order before an ex tried harming me, but it never worked out. Who knows what would have happened if I'd have gone. It's certainly a scary thought. I'm a 29 year old female and my partner is a 23 year old female. We're back in her hometown visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small isolated town in the middle of nowhere and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area, Kyle. We met Kyle at the beach and right away, he's acting super weird, making jokes, that are highly inappropriate and unwelcome. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So me and my girlfriend were shooting each other panicked looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry and that she's never seen him be like this before and that we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar, but he just asks to join us. We felt awkward and ended up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he followed us. We get there, order drinks and food, and then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking on the patio and just chilling. The food arrives, we finish it quicker, and here's where it gets really messed up. Halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as I've had a long day. I give my girlfriend that signal that I wanna go, and she makes an excuse that we need to leave. 
He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got some really good stuff. And you can meet my cats, blah, blah, blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no when making excuses and that we need to check on her grandpa. So finally, we get into the car and say goodnight. We've parked next to each other and walked up to the cars together while saying our goodbyes. When we get in the car, my girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do. He says his GPS is being funny and can we lead him to the main road? To be fair, we were in the middle of nowhere. So this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously staying behind the bar was out at that point. In the car, we're talking about just how pushy he was being and how she admits she feels strange driving right back to her grandparents house. So we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off his exit. We think it's weird, but aren't really sure what to do. Finally, we get onto a two lane road and he pulls up next to us and is waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for a few seconds and then leaves in a hurry. Here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We knew she had her phone. I saw her put it in her fanny pack on the table along with my phone and a few other things a few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave. She didn't take it back out. There's literally no way she could have left it at the bar. More importantly, he got into his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bar in the first place and he saw it was left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly saying goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now the kicker, apparently unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend has tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he'd been acting. This is why she wanted us to stay at the bar to get away from him and stay in public where she felt safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this. So that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicion sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear though. He stole my girlfriend's phone and it seems like he did that so we would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere. He also ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her weapon. And they've been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel he would have acted confused about the weapon or said something like, lol, what are you doing? But instead he booked it which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. Finally, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I half finished mine and felt very tired. I don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us knowing or noticing. It doesn't really make sense, but he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in the fanny pack perfectly. We also have no idea how we could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender, but we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy comments and probably tried to spike our drinks and stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road Let's not meet again. At the time of this story, my family and I lived in Northeast Ohio. Most of our extended family on my father's side lived in Central Florida. So for the Christmas holidays, we would go and spend time with my grandparents and aunts and uncles. At the time I was six years old, my brother Russ was four 
and my brother Chase was two, and my brother Braden was four months. The trip down to Florida was uneventful. We did not come across any car wrecks or anything of interest. It was a very long drive though, especially with a four month old baby. We drove in a red minivan that was loaded down to clothes and toys. You could imagine all the toys that we bought to celebrate our Christmas, along with what our grandparents were going to give us. Christmas with my grandparents was fantastic. We had aunts and uncles and lots of cousins. We ate, talked and played. There were tons of toys and new outfits. When the time came to go home, we had twice as much as what we came with. My mum had to put our clothes in trash bags and pack them underneath the seats and on the floorboards of the van. When we climbed in, we were walking on top of our toys and clothes and we didn't mind it much being kids. We started our long trip back. After we went north for a while and were in a different state, my dad realized that we were losing gas incredibly fast. We had to stop several times to fill up. And that's when my dad decided to stop at a mechanics. We had spent all of our extra money in Florida and my parents had not planned on having to stop to get the van serviced. It was kind of neat and kind of annoying at the same time to be stuck in this mechanic shop, not having the money for a hotel or even a motel. So we spent the night in the car while it was up in the lift at the mechanics worked underneath it, loud, noisy, and not smelling very good. After lots of money and being stuck in a mechanic shop for a while, my dad decided that enough was enough and we were going to leave. A lot of improvements had been made to the van, but the main problem was not fixed. Back on the road, we finally made it to the Smoky Mountains. It was beautiful considering that it was Christmas time and there was pristine snow on both sides of the highway. It was very early morning and we had just woken up. We were in pajamas and odds and ends of clothing. My brother Chase was wearing his coat and a pair of sweatpants. Ross only wore a pair of sweatpants and I had a pair of corduroy pants, socks and a t-shirt. My mum had opened the bag of M&Ms that had been sitting between her and my dad while they were driving down the road, periodically handing us back handfuls of bright candy. I had climbed up to the middle seat when my brother's car seat was slid in while he went to the back to sit with Russ. Since I was in the middle, I had to give candy to my two younger brothers. It was odd because the candy coating was melting, leaving yellow and green smears all over my hands. It was the 80s and we weren't wearing seatbelts. My mom had just finished feeding Braden and set him back in the car seat, not bothering to buckle him up either. It's important to note that my brother Chase did not talk a lot. In fact, he only spoke when he really wanted to, which was quite rare. And this made all of the situation so much more shocking. We were rolling along in relative silence when my brother Chase yelled out, fire. Everyone in the car quickly turned to see the orange and yellow flames in the back window. My mother quickly turned to my dad and quietly said, Kevin, we're on fire. My dad started tapping the brakes to slow down turned on his turn signal and tried to get us out of the right lane to the left lane so that we could stop. He looked at my mum, and I remember him saying in a hushed voice, no brakes. At this point, other cars had began to slow down with us and had started to honk on their horns to get our attention to let us know we were on fire. My dad continued into the left lane and nudged the guardrail, which startled us all. He was using it to help us slow down since our brakes had long since burnt off and were probably laying in the middle of the highway somewhere. We had slowed down some, but were not slowing down enough. In my mum's mind, she saw us all perishing. She made a decision that to this day still shocks me. She opened her car door and leapt out. All of a sudden, my mum was gone. I couldn't see her. And then the sliding door opened with a fierce crack. It promptly fell off and hit the road. 
My mum, being the superwoman that she was, leapt over the top of the door and continued to run alongside the van. The woman was running next to a moving, flaming vehicle. As we slowed down, the flames had become much higher. Now they were starting to encircle the van. They had slowly crept up from the back window, around to the sides where the sliding door was, and were almost at the front doors. My mum was faced with a wall of fire between her and her children. She later told us that she couldn't see much through the flames. What she did see were the bright colours of Chase's coat. She reached through the flames and grabbed my little brother and pulled him out. She then threw him on the side of the road. He bumped and skidded along the soft shoulder of gravel. And a few moments later, my dad was able to get the car stopped by bumping the guardrail. And now that my mum's door was shut because of the guardrail and the wall of fire that I saw out the sliding door, I had no way out. My dad threw open his door and I saw my chance. I grabbed his broad shoulders and hung on for dear life. As he jumped out the van, he inadvertently dragged me along with him, pulling me over his seat. Boy, was I lucky. When he ran around to the side of the van, I slid off of him. I looked for my mum and saw her running down the mountain. I climbed over the guardrail and began to run to her and yell for her. And she turned and yelled at me to run. I started down the steep hill of the mountain. It was freezing. The snow had dug one of my socks off my foot. I stopped to look for my sock. And that is when I saw my mum saw me and yell again for me to keep running. She stopped and waited for me. When I got to her, she grabbed me and continued to run as fast as she could. I was cold, but she said it didn't matter. Little did I know that my dad had gone in to rescue my two other brothers. When he reached the side of the van where the sliding door had been, he was met with the same thing my mum was, a wall of fire. He knew that Braden's car seat was just beyond the flames. He reached out and grabbed my infant brother as the fire engulfed his car seat. My brother Russ had made it from the back seat to the middle and then to the front seats. And my dad told him to jump as the flames overtook the van. Turning to make his escape and jump over the guardrail, my dad reached behind for my brother. To his surprise and horror, my brother wasn't there. He turned and saw my brother still standing between the two front seats. So he did what any dad would. He reached through the fire once again and grabbed my brother by the back of his sweatpants. He yanked him out, threw him over the shoulder, quickly turning and putting one leg over the guardrail to make a dash for safety. The van exploded. The force knocked my dad over the rail and put him and my two brothers in the snow. He was able to keep hold of his sons and run. The van proceeded to explode twice more. As my mum and me went further down the mountain, she was able to see what was happening. When we eventually heard the boom, she shielded mine and my brother's tiny frames with her body. Eventually, we all met up on the side of the road. There was a nice older lady waiting for us with a blanket. She took me, Russ and Chase and put us in her car with the heat on full blast. When the door shut, Russ turned to us and said, Look. He opened his hands and had showed us a melted mess of green, yellow and orange candy. They'd melted. Fire trucks and ambulances showed up. My mum was trying to hush Braden, but the heat had been so intense that it had dried up her milk and she couldn't feed him. The firemen gave us colouring books and oxygen. At the hospital, we were all examined. I only had a small scratch from the snow. Russ was treated for smoke inhalation. His blonde hair was now so matted and an orange colour from the heat and flames. My dad had no hair on either arm and no eyebrows and was treated for smoke inhalation also. My mum's arm was hairless. Her milk was dry, but she was fine. Chase had some road rash from my mum getting him out of the way. Poor Braden, he had it the worst. While my dad had been trying to get him out, there must have been a flame or some hot metal that he touched. He had been burnt so badly. 30 years on, fortunately, he has no scars or any lasting damage. We really should have all perished. There are a lot of ifs or buts, but the important thing is we're alive. My parents are heroes. They saved not one, but four kids under the age of seven. They literally went through fire for us, risked life and limb, and that is pure love. That is family. The cause of the fire was a dime-sized hole in the gas tank. 
the mechanics had fixed everything but that. 30 years later, I'm still afraid to get into any red minivans. I'm a 23 year old female. I live in a townhouse with my two children of ages two and six months. My fiance did live with us until two weeks ago when I caught him with another woman and made him move out. That's important to the story. I'm a stay at home mom and when he did live with us, my ex worked evenings. Let me set the scene. We live in a tiny house in Northern Pennsylvania. My line of townhouses sits in front of a big field that runs in line with the woods. As far as I'm aware, these woods stretch for at least a few miles, and I'm not aware of any houses in the area or any roads that lead through them. My living room has three windows that look to the field, and my bedroom on the second floor only has one window that faces that way as well. People do tend to walk their dogs back in the field and kids sometimes play there, but I rarely ever see anyone close to my house. For that reason, I tend to leave my blinds and curtains open, partially because I just enjoy the view. July 2019, a year ago, I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep. All the lights were off, but I had my window and blinds open since it was warm. I was looking out the window and I noticed small red and white lights just outside. I got up and looked to realize the lights were coming from a drone. I ran downstairs to where my fiance of the time was sitting in the living room and ran to the window. I told him what I saw, but of course, when he went to look, it was gone. I was paranoid that the drone could have had a camera on it and someone was watching me with it. I kept my blinds closed for a while after that. Fast forward to January of this year. I stupidly got comfortable and assumed that whoever it was flying the drone was a one time creep. My blinds were open and I had just gotten out of the shower. I was sitting on my bed, pretty much in my birthday suit except for my underwear, scrolling on my phone, when out of the corner of my eye I saw lights again from the dark window. It was that drone again. I ran out of the room and waited for a few minutes. I peeked back into my room and it was gone. I quickly shut my blinds again and got dressed. Honestly, I felt sick at how stupid I was to leave my window open again, especially when I was practically undressed. Now for the really disturbing part. My two year old son and I were out in the field two weeks ago, three days after I kicked out my boyfriend. We were playing ball. I had my six month old strapped to me in a baby carrier. Probably about a half hour after we'd been out there, I heard a slight whirring noise coming towards us. I looked up and saw that damn drone flying towards us. I looked around and didn't see anyone. It stopped right over us. I freaked and grabbed my son and dragged him into the house, looking back at the tree line every so often as we went. I knew they had to be hiding in there. I went inside, closed the blinds and called my mum and told her about the situation. She told me to just keep an eye out and I said I would. My son likes to line up his toys along the windowsill, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to open them up just an inch or so. A little while later after we ate dinner, it was almost dark. I was feeding my six month old and my son was playing. He was standing over by the window, lining up his toys, and he started saying, Dada, Dada. I assume he was just missing his father and dismissed him by saying he was gonna see him that weekend. He kept saying, Dada, Dada. I looked up and saw him pointing to the window under the little gap the blinds didn't cover. I froze. I remember that he calls any man with facial hair Dada because it reminds him of his father there was no way someone would be bold enough to actually come up to my window. Not when my neighbors are literally right there. Anyone could see them, but there aren't any lights back there. So unless someone actually stepped out their house, I guess no one would see them. Maybe it was my ex, but he should be at work at that time. 
I ran to the window and moved my son, and I didn't want to lift the blinds, but honestly, I was sure it had to be the person who'd been creeping on me for the past year, but I wanted to see who it was. I pushed the blinds up, and I was looking at a man that I had never seen before, crouching in front of me. He was bald with a moustache and goatee. I have no idea how old he was. He could have been anywhere from 30 to 50. When he saw me, he smiled and stood up. I yelled and told him to leave and that I was calling the cops. He just stood there, smiling at me like some freak. I was about to close the blinds again when he said something I couldn't hear. I told him to leave again and he said it louder this time. I just want to talk to you. I shook my head. No. And he yelled the same thing over. He started slapping his hands on the window, yelling no, 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 over and over. I grabbed my phone, scared he was trying to break in and dialed 911. My kids were crying from the yelling, and I was on the verge of tears. I told the operator what was going on. The whole time I was on the phone, the man was pounding on my window, screaming. He was yelling all kinds of nonsense, and I only caught some of it. He said he's been watching me for months, that I'm beautiful, and he wants me to come with him, and that he'll end the lives of the little ones if I didn't. The operator told me to go into an upstairs room and hide until the police arrive. My town doesn't have a police department, so we rely on the state police and she said it would be about 20 minutes, but just to stay on the phone with her. The man was practically punching my window now and was screaming like a maniac. I was about to grab my kids and run upstairs when I heard someone else screaming. The man bolted. I looked out and saw my neighbor and his girlfriend. I opened the window and my neighbor said that he heard the man, so he ran around the building. He said when the guy heard him, he ran back into the woods and disappeared into the tree line. They said they also had called the police. I thanked them a hundred times, and the police got there ten minutes later. They did a quick search around the buildings and in the trees, but obviously didn't find anything. I've been super paranoid since then, and stayed at my parents a few nights after it happened. I don't know why that guy targeted me, or why he waited so long to do something. I'm just happy my neighbors were there to intervene, or who knows what would have happened. So to the creep who's been following me and my family for the last year, I genuinely hope we never meet again. I used to date a girl in college who lived three hours away. We would trade weekends, one at her school, one at mine. One day she got upset because she had driven all the way to see me, and I was in an all-night study session which she had known about and couldn't be home to see her. She texted me that she was going back to her place and I never heard anything from her again. After three days of texting her, trying to make sure she was okay, her messages started coming back as number not found. I sent her the stuff she'd left at my apartment in the mail and it returned as no forwarding address. Her instant messenger account, which I had never messaged but knew the name of, disconnected and it gets weirder. I called her apartment landline and was told the people who had lived there had moved out. She had three roommates and didn't leave a number as to where they went. I got really freaked out and asked friends who worked in school admin to pull some strings, just to make sure she was alive. The school she was at didn't have any record of her as a student. The license plate to her car wasn't registered to anyone None of our mutual friends ever saw her again, and I called the police, but there were no car accidents involving anyone who fit her description in this stretch of road between our two schools that night, or in the two weeks that followed. I didn't ask for a longer time frame because at that point, she was already missing. Cops wouldn't file a missing person report because I wasn't a family member. To this day, I have no idea what happened. Why she freaked out on me so bad, or if she's still alive, or in witness protection, or was erased from all time by an evil wizard. She literally vanished without a trace. 
I work in the criminal justice field, where I see a lot of crime, and I'm also naturally a follower of scary movies and stories in general. So I have to disclaim that I do have a heightened sense of paranoia. But my girlfriend and her roommate both agreed this was weird. I was out walking my girlfriend's roommate's dog as she was working a night shift in their neighborhood, which is a very safe suburb of New York. I walked across the parking lot and to this field in the middle of a rotary or roundabout, whatever you call them. I lived in Boston for a while and they call them rotaries and was screwing around on Reddit since it was near midnight and in the middle of quarantine. So there were no cars out. The dog had a long leash. So she was sniffing around and then I saw her stop and stare toward the road. I looked up and saw a black SUV stopped in the rotary. I pulled on my COVID mask that was on my chin. Since no one was around, I had it off. And some people in New York are touchy about that, which is understandable. Just in case they stopped to lecture me and I didn't care to engage in argument. I looked back at my phone and then back up and the SUV was still there. It was a family, mother, father in the front and a 12 year old daughter or something like that in the back seat. I was a bit startled because they were all just blankly staring directly at me. I sort of waved and nodded and started walking the dog a bit around the grass and they started to move slowly. They came around the rotary and I looked back and all of them were staring at me again. I figured they may talk to me so I stopped and waited for them to get around the circle. But when they approached they kept driving very slowly or staring directly at me. I gave another half wave and they drove past me still slowly and staring and then back around the circle and then again around the circle. Literally all of them blanket staring me even with a little girl in the back seat. They did this a few more times and I started to walk up to the edge of the circle to engage, which is normally something I would not do, but it was a family. So I felt a little bit more brave. They sped up a bit and went around the corner and turned off the rotary. I started to feel even weirder. So I decided I would walk back to her apartment building when they entered the rotary again. I was watching them from the corner of my eye and they were still staring. I started picking up the pace and they turned off the rotary towards me and I picked up the pace as they followed me. Once I got to the sidewalk, I turned around because I didn't want them to know which door I was walking into. It's on a strip mall with a few other apartment buildings and stores and they stopped about 30 feet behind me and they were all staring out the front window. The little girl was in the center seat now staring too. I once again raised my arm. Can I help you? And got no response at all. I kind of stood there and no movement and took my phone out and typed their license plate into a note app. I was thinking this is starting to get weird. I then slowly turned on the other side of the parking lot, all still staring until they got to the end and I rushed into the apartment building, which luckily needs a code to enter. I got up, told my girlfriend and her roomie about it in the morning and they both freaked out a little. I watched them out the window and they pulled back up to where I was standing on the sidewalk and just sat there in their car. I couldn't see them at this point, could only see the roof. It felt like 10 minutes before they slowly started to drive away. I can't stop thinking about their creepy ass blank stare. Somehow it made it creepier that it was a normal looking family with a young daughter. If it was like two younger guys, I could have marked it off as they were bored and just messing with me. But this made no sense. I grew up in a small town and could walk and play a couple of blocks from home but only with the company of one of my older brothers and later our family dog, a super protective Rottweiler mix when I was older. 
I was never allowed to leave the house by myself because my parents didn't want anything happening to me. There was a well-known neighborhood creep, probably 60 or so in age, that lived alone in a house on the street adjacent to ours. In the house next to his lived a couple that were good neighbors and great friends of my parents. Their name were the Smiths. They were about the same age as my parents and loved children, but they couldn't have any of their own. My parents had seven biological kids and four non-biological. I was the youngest. There were a few incidents where I remember running into the neighborhood creep. One being when I was at the corner of the gas station with one of my brothers, when he came up behind me and smelled my hair and told my brother that I was cute. Another time when I was riding with my dad in his truck and the guy flagged down my dad and asked him if I was my dad's wife and I was 10 at the time. He was a major creep, but there is one incident that will always stick with me. Me and my siblings would occasionally go over to the Smith's house because they were really nice, loved us and would let us swim in their pool as we didn't have one. They would also pay us for doing small odd jobs. They sometimes would watch me for my parents as most of my siblings were teenagers with a lot of extracurricular activities. One day, my brother and I went over to the Smith's house. My brother was in charge of watching me that day and Mr. Smith offered my brother some money to help him move some stuff out of the front of their house for a yard sale and to help them sell things. While the yard sale was going on, I was sitting on their front porch playing with my Barbie doll. A few people had come and gone. My brother and Mr. Smith went inside to go through more things to sell and Mrs. Smith was busy trying to help someone to buy things. Then came along neighborhood creep. He looks around a bit trying to seem interested in buying stuff, then came up to me, bent down, touched my hair and said, how much for you? I was incredibly shy as a child and occasionally burst into tears even when someone waved at me that was unfamiliar. The man literally made me pee my pants. I immediately started crying and screaming repeatedly for my brother. Mr. Smith and my brother came running out and all I remember was my brother picking me up and carrying me home while Mr. Smith tried to figure out what happened. I live in New Orleans and years ago, my brother wanted to adopt a dog from a small rural town about two hours away. It was an easy enough drive, but we got close to the town of Clinton and I started noticing a ton of police driving around. No sirens, nobody speeding by, but I think I probably saw 15 to 20 patrol cars in the span of about 10 minutes. We get to the house meet the foster mum and the dog, who is the sweetest thing in the world, and decide to adopt her and head home about two hours later. Everything seems fine. Tally, the dog, climbs up in the front seat while I'm driving and falls asleep, leaving my brother to sit in the back by himself, which was hilarious. We keep driving and notice that there are even more cops driving around, but still no sirens. They're just everywhere though. As we're leaving Clinton, maybe about three miles or so to the exit, I notice this old white sedan coming flying up on our rear, flashing their lights and honking. I didn't really think about it, but I figured maybe these people were hurt or needed something. It definitely wasn't a cop car, but it was unusual for sure. I started to pull over to the shoulder and they pulled over as well about 10 to 15 yards behind us when they stopped. I stopped the car and when I turned around, I looked at my brother. For some reason, as soon as our eyes met, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end and I realized there was something very wrong about this. I hesitated, wanting to see if someone needed help. But as soon as the door of the car behind us opened, a voice in my head said to get the hell out of there. I peeled out, sped for the exit, making sure nobody had followed us, and we got back to New Orleans safe and sound. 
but the entire time I was watching for that car to ensure they didn't follow. I never learned what happened with all the police cars or the white sedan, but something was really wrong. I should have listened to my gut way sooner. Stopping even temporarily was really stupid of me. I hypothesize that there was some kind of raid or something, and the cops were looking for someone as we were driving through. The white sedan was trying to get us to pull over so they could carjack us and dodge the cops further. I don't know though, and I hope that it was someone innocent that needed help and I just bailed. But I don't know. I have a pretty strong feeling, as does my brother, that there was something funky going on. This happened to my childhood friend, Jean. He was the only son of an immigrant couple. They had him in later years, so he lived a completely sheltered life and had a complete lack of social skills and social development. They had no other family around, only friends, mostly other immigrants from the same country. Jean's father was very well off, but he lived like a miser. So Jean grew up thinking they were middle class bordering on poor. When Jean was in his 30s, his father passed away from an illness. Shortly after that, his mother was tragically struck by a vehicle and killed as she crossed a busy street. Jean was left all alone and in charge of a fortune and assets he was ill prepared to handle. Out of nowhere, a relative from the old country appears. She was young, attractive, and a lady, supposedly a distant cousin. Soon she was seen with Jean here and there, not too often, but often enough that people began to notice. Three months later, Jean simply vanished. No one knew where he went, why he wasn't around, and now the cousin had control of the fortune. Another friend of the family got concerned and called the local police to report him as a missing person. The guy in charge told the friend to never inquire again about Jean, to better leave this matter alone. No one knows what happened to Jean, but several of us have several guesses. We were living in a new apartment in the San Francisco Bay Area. I had a one year old son and I was pregnant with my second child. I stayed home during the day with him one day after lunchtime, I got a knock at the door, and when I looked through the peephole, I saw a guy wearing a shirt with the logo for an appliance company. It was like LG or Whirlpool or something. I opened up the door, and he said he was going around inspecting the appliances of the apartments to see who qualifies for new or replacement stuff. In my naive and pregnant brain state, I let the guy in. My son was super grumpy because it was his nap time, so I totally was not thinking, and honestly barely listening to the guy, just trying to console a fussy toddler until we could nap. I assumed the apartment manager sent him or something. He quickly looked around at our fridge and all that, said thanks, and said we would get a call if we qualified. I mentioned this to my husband when he got home, and he told me it was super weird, and he had never heard anything like that happening before. When we mentioned it to the apartment manager, she said they hadn't sent anyone to do that and wasn't notified that anyone was. I also never got a call from the company, which, duh, they wouldn't even have my phone number. I never found out who the guy really was. He could have been a total scammer who was trying to scope the place to rob us. There were no reports of burglaries in any other apartments, though they were probably smarter than me and didn't let him in. If his intentions were to rob us, we're lucky because we were broke. Even my phone was junk at that point. We had no computer, no tablets, and all that he could have seen were some kids toys and our old TV. Nothing of much value to anyone. Of course, my thoughts have turned more sinister than that, and I wondered if he had more malicious intent. But because I had a fussy toddler on my hip, he just kept up the ruse of doing his job and left quickly. Who knows, just assumptions at this point. I have no way of knowing what he was doing, but I've always been way more cautious about trusting people just because they are in uniform or whatever. I don't let people I don't know into the house unless I'm expecting them. 
and I'm so glad this lesson was learned from a situation that ended up harmless. This past Friday, I, a 27-year-old male, fell asleep around 8pm after work. When I woke up around 9, I decided it was too late to go out, so I made a plan to run to the gym down the street instead for a late night workout. The small all men's gym is just about a mile down the road. It was empty and dark inside, but the owner had given me a door code to get in. However, for whatever reason, the code wasn't working and I could not get to the gym. I wanted to work out, so I decided I would just extend my run and head up to the local middle school playground and do some pull-ups on the monkey bars instead. I figured it was better than no workout at all. I got to the block that the middle school was on and began walking down towards the playground. On the way, I passed two young girls walking in the opposite direction. I would guess they looked about 11 or 12. They were silent and looked at me nervously as we passed. Understandable, as I'm a reasonably large man standing at 6 foot 4 at almost 10 p.m. on an empty street at night. I live in a little suburban town of about 12,000 people with little crime. It's a dry town with mostly larger residential homes. The town is only two miles across and is very safe has a family feel, and most of the residents are upper-class families that take advantage of the great school system. Despite the reputation of safety the town has, I thought it was much too late and dark for these two young girls to be wandering the streets alone, and creeps can show up anywhere at any time. Something I would soon enough witness to be true. I hope they're heading home, I thought to myself. I then got to the playground attached to the middle school. The playground is on the corner of the block, with an alley leading to the parking lot behind the school, separating the playground from the local high speed line, going into the nearby city about 10 miles away. The high speed line is built underground, with an open top and high walls topped off with a chain link fence to keep pedestrians from falling in. There is a bridge to cross the tracks below, and then another street on the other side of the tracks from the school running parallel to the rails, with one way going into the downtown business district and the other way going into a residential neighborhood. The young girls turn on this street, going towards the neighborhood away from downtown. I did one set of pull-ups on the monkey bars and was resting when I noticed a white pickup truck with the headlights cut and a raised cab with blacked out windows covering the bed of the pickup truck moving slowly past the middle school in the same direction of the girls moments before. I found this very suspicious, and even more so once the truck stopped directly in front of the playground, almost as though the driver slash passenger was checking it out. I stared at the truck, wondering what was going on, when I noticed there was a man walking about 20 feet behind the truck in the same direction. As he passed the stopped truck, the window of the truck was rolled down and I could see there were two men in it. I clearly saw them look over and made a keep going forward hand signal to the driver slash passenger, which followed his direction and started moving again, creeping slowly along with the headlights cut just as they were before. I watched as they crossed the tracks and saw the man on foot go right on the parallel road along the tracks towards downtown while the truck went left on the same street towards the residential neighborhood in the same direction the young girls had gone no less than three minutes before. What the hell did I just witness, I thought to myself, as I tried to make sense of what I had just seen. To me, it seemed that the truck and man on foot were following the young girls, stopped at the playground to see if that's where they were going, and kept going when they only saw me doing pull-ups. I felt sick to my stomach. I tried to think of what else these men could have been up to, looking for a lost dog? No, they weren't calling out and were driving much too slowly. Doing a deal? Maybe. But what kind of deal goes down in a fairly well-lit school area? Also the man on foot signalling the truck forwards and then going the opposite way down the next cross street did not make any sense. 
In my head I thought at best what I saw was some kind of deal, and at worst was two predators. I decided to follow the man on foot to find out. I followed him as he walked along the wall separating the sidewalk from the tracks below. On the other side of the street was a church and some office buildings. He was slowly walking and texting someone on his phone. I turned around and saw the truck had stopped again about two blocks up the road in the opposite direction. The man on foot then completely stopped as I approached him. I couldn't be sure as to whether he realized I was pursuing him, so I approached him in the most casual way possible. The man looked to be in his early 30s, stood to about 5 foot 10 with a slouch, had curly hair with a noticeable scar going down the side of his head through his hair. From the moment I began to speak, this man, I could tell, was very nervous. The way he acted and spoke with me made me even more suspicious up until the conclusion of our conversation. Admittedly, my adrenaline was going, so I don't remember how the conversation went word for word, but this is pretty much it. Hey man, what's up? What are you doing? Uh, not much. Just hanging out. Just hanging out, huh? Where are you going? Just on a wall. I saw you signaling to that sketchy truck back at the playground. That was kind of weird. What's up with that? Nothing at all. I, j I just waved at them as I walked by. You didn't just wave at them. I saw you make a hand signal for them to keep going. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know them. I'm not stupid. I clearly saw you signal them. I know you know them. Just tell me what you're really doing out here because it's very suspicious. The creep at this point then nervously starts walking away from me. I'm not up to anything. I put my hand on the man's shoulder to stop him. No, stop. Tell me what you're doing right now. You're acting very sketchy and it's making me nervous. I know you're up to something, so tell me the truth. I don't care if you're doing a deal or whatever. I'm not doing anything, I swear I'm a good Christian man. I swear. Then he points to a church behind me across the street. And me, as suspicious as ever, replies. I didn't ask your religion, what you were, or whether you're a good person or not. I asked what you're doing with that sketchy truck. Now, do you want to tell me, or should I call the police and have them come ask you? You can call the police, I'm not up to anything. Leave me alone, I'm scared. The man then turned to start walking away faster this time. I admit I was quite angry at this point, and I knew I was clearly being lied to, and this guy was definitely up to no good. I push him very hard with one arm to get him to stop. The dude loses his balance and almost falls over, but then immediately starts sprinting away from me down the street, turns the corner and then continues to sprint into the downtown business district, passing right past a few other pedestrians on the street. There was no reason for me to chase him, so I lost sight of him as he ran away. I look back at the truck down the road that was stopped at the beginning of the confrontation, and it was gone. I then take out my cell phone and call the non-emergency police line to report everything. The police thanked me and sent a patrol car to the area by the middle school. When I told my girlfriend about what happened, she was very upset with me for following and confronting the man. However, after what I saw, I'm still convinced that I witnessed three men stalking two underaged girls, possibly with intent. I could not come up with any other explanation as to what could have possibly been going on. Seeing how nervous the man was talking to me, paired with how he lied and then took off running, only further convinced me of what I saw. I followed my gun instinct and took action. I would do it all again. However, I would have called the police before confronting the man myself if I could redo the whole thing. My girlfriend's concern was for my safety, although I was much bigger than the man and made sure he was at least at arm's length at me at all times. He could have been armed, so I understand her concern. At the very least, I hope I thwarted a possible crime. And for the creep that ran away, let's not meet again. I got kicked out of my house when I was 15, and I had been homeless periodically, and this was in one of those times. It was cold and I didn't want to be sleeping outdoors, so I had to go through social services and they put me into what's called emergency housing. The people who approve of these standards need to be fired yesterday. 
They sent me to one of the worst neighborhoods ever, into a house where I was the only female with four grown men for housemates, and there was no one there supervising anything. Half the house was made up of a burnt out porch. There were both rats, roaches, of monstrous proportions and usually no heat or hot water. Me and one of the guys ended up sharing a room. Jay, one of our other housemates. I never actually saw this guy and don't know even if he lived there anymore or what. Another one was actually decent, but he drank so much every night that he forgot how keys worked and he was usually found passed out on the floor outside the door. And there was this guy from the Caribbean. We used to call him C. This dude was creepy as hell. He had a lot of questionable friends and they knew that our front door lock generally didn't work. So it wasn't uncommon to just run into random people making grilled cheese sandwiches in the middle of the night when I went up to pee. Me and Jay also liked to mess with C because one, we were stupid teenagers who didn't realize that these people were dangerous and two, we were both asses who didn't have much to do and we liked to screw around with C because we kept telling him to stop lining his teeth up on the windowsill by the kitchen table when they fell out from all that usage. Because you know, it's not the most appetizing thing to look at when you're eating. So one night, after a new tooth was added, we decided that we would just turn everything into the kitchen upside down and wait for him to come into the kitchen and pretend like it was perfectly normal. We spent four hours doing this and it was almost impressive. It worked too, because he completely lost his mind after we kept telling him that the kitchen looked normal. Also, it should be noted that it was December and we didn't have heat again, but this dude was jittering around the house in his tidy whities swearing like a sprinkler. So C went to his room and he's cursing and slamming things around in there. J goes to the bathroom and I hear C come tearing out when J comes running into the room and slams the door looking terrified. He throws the chain locks on the door and tells me we've got to move the beds and dresses against the door and that C has a sword or something. It was a machete and the thing comes blade first through the door just like The Shining, but with a crazy behind it. So we're frantically trying to move our mattress against the door and the dresser, and we have no other way out besides this window, but we're gonna have to go quietly as hell under his window and run through the woods into the dark to get to the nearest payphone to call the cops. Luckily, C is still making a lot of noise going at the door, so we're able to get past his window and the payphone. The cops were able to get to the house easily because the front door was still unlocked for everyone to come and go as they pleased. He was arrested fairly easily as he's quite small and there were many cops. C had several outstanding warrants so he ended up getting locked up for quite a while. J was and is a complete piece of garbage unrelated to the story and after this happening social services thought that maybe this wasn't the best housing arrangement for me and I was moved elsewhere. I never heard anything else about C after that, as there are a lot of even worse things that happened, and this event was put into the past, and for some reason, it popped into my head. Maybe you didn't want to know this information, but as the story took place, me and Jay had ended up becoming a couple. I had to go to another state for a week, and when I got back, things between Jay and I were off. Long story short, my brother and my best friend, who incidentally is now my boyfriend, We've been friends for over 20 years and he's also my brother's best friend, found out that Jay had cheated on me during the whole duration I was away. Now my brother was a year younger than I, and out of everyone I've ever had in my life, he was true, and the true best friend, and we were extremely close. We both had the same friends, played in each other's bands, and were extremely close. So when my brother found out Jay had been cheating on me, he didn't take it kindly. And about a year later, my brother was taken from us. His life was ended. So being that me and my brother were so close, obviously this was the worst thing that ever happened in my life and it devastated me and my family, especially my mum. A few weeks after that, I went to get food with my mum. And who's there? Jay. He found out what happened to my brother 
and he starts mouthing off that my brother got what he deserved. I'm trying to get this guy, but my mom is begging me to just come with her and leave and I didn't want to upset her anymore. So we went to the parking lot. This guy not only follows us out there, but he also pulls out a sharp instrument on us. I see red, because now he's threatening my mum, and I have this big ass messenger bag that's crammed full of heavy stuff, and I swing it around as hard as I can and hit him on the side of the arm and head. He ended up dropping the implement, and I kick it away and pushed him as hard as I could and ran to the car. My mum had gotten into the car and started it and backed out, so she could have been readied out of there. All of this happened within a few seconds and we just took off. We didn't call the cops, because my family and I had more than enough to do with them, and they failed us on many times. So if any of you wondering why I didn't like Jay anymore, that is the reason. My family moved into a new home about four years ago, and I've always had an off feeling about the house, but I put it down to paranoia. I woke up in the middle of the night with scratches all over my body, but I had no reason to think I wasn't doing it in my sleep. I moved on to being a college student living on campus. I haven't woken up with scratches once. Now home for the holidays, the first night staying back in the house, I woke up with scratches. I stayed again and woke up with scratches the next morning and my girlfriend finally made me realize it was only happening when I was staying home. So I stayed at her house for around four days and didn't get scratched once. Now writing this, I had just stayed in my house again last night and woke up with a scratch on my side and now I feel more creeped out than ever. I don't own any pets and due to living on campus, my old room was taken over by my younger brother. So this happened sleeping in two different rooms. I've read about others' experiences, and next time I will sleep with gloves. I honestly don't want to wake up with new scratches. The thought of it is terrifying. Back in college, I took a road trip from Philadelphia to Washington. I was driving through the Midwest, but I can't remember where exactly. I drove through the US multiple times, and I can't remember if this happened on the upper or lower routes I'd taken. If I had to guess, I'd bet that it was Wyoming. It was late at night on an empty road. I was cruising at a decent speed, my car was working fine, and I had adequate snacks and water, and I was just jamming out to some CDs. Life was good when I suddenly got an overwhelming feeling of something weird happening around me. I couldn't see anything besides the road. There were no mountains visible. The sky was overcast and the only thing in existence seemed to be me and what was illuminated by my headlights. It was then that I saw another car, the only car I'd seen for a few hours, which stood out due to that. It was a pickup truck with lots of rust around the back and it had one of those cabin things on the bed the covers with the windows, I don't know what they're called, that looked half busted with duct tape all over the window part. I hadn't seen it prior and would have known it was driving in front of me too. And there were no connecting roads. So it must have come in from either the grass or off the shoulder where it had been parked. Anyway, I'm still cruising, but it was weird. I remember being frustrated because the guy in front of me was slowly reducing his speed and thus mine. I considered passing him, but it was only two lanes and I didn't really want to do it in the dark, so whatever. It hit ahead when I noticed that in front of us, there was a tiny forest all around the road. It stretched on for maybe 300 yards and half of that away from the road, but covered it on both sides. The guy in front of me kept slowing down, but when we approached this point, he really started slowing down, almost like he intended to stop. This was not good. I suddenly passed him and sped up like a bat out of hell, putting everything in my trusty Crown Vic into action. I saw out the mirror that the truck ended up stopping and pulling off to the side completely, as I'm flooring it and thinking I must be paranoid and the guy might need help. I see a van slash truck, one of those big box types parked in the trees off the road. 
and some shadows of people walking in front of it. I wasn't going to stop anyway, but that kept me from even thinking about the idea. Woke me right the hell up. Occasionally I do wonder what the hell they were up to. Since almost a year now, at the end of August 2019 to be exact, I have moved to an apartment in a different city because my mother, who I lived with in my hometown, passed away from cancer. I have moved here with my long-term boyfriend and one other roommate, who has been a very good friend to both of us since before we had even started dating. We all absolutely love it here. The location is great. It's a 15 minute bike ride from my university and is located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms, etc. So we pretty much have everything we could possibly need to survive within walking distance. However, after just a month of living here, someone has started to ring the doorbell at exactly 11.05 p.m. semi-regularly, sometimes every day, sometimes every other day. Sometimes there's a week in between, and sometimes there's a couple of weeks in between but it's always at around 11.05 p.m. And every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is. Except for once, but I'll get to that soon enough. At first, I thought it were friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell. But after the fourth time, I grew suspicious. And after more than those four times, I started noticing that it always happened at either exactly or around 11.05 p.m. My boyfriend and roommate both work at bars, and so they work until very late and would usually get in at around 2 a.m. So each time it happened, I was always alone at home, and it started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they kind of shrugged it off and said that it was probably a wrong dial, like I thought at first. But when I told them that it had happened so many times, and sometimes even daily, they didn't believe me and thought I was just a little paranoid and spooked. However, one night, when the doorbell rang again, and I answered the intercom asking who it was, I heard very heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked at that moment. I was again home alone and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't make out from the breathing if it was a man or woman, but I heard a strange mumbling and then it was dead silent, as they had appeared to have left. I had put my apartment door on a double lock after that. I was so scared and spooked out, and thankfully my roommate got home a little earlier that night around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang, and he could tell how upset I was. Now with the coronavirus, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore, and they now also witnessed the frequent door ringing at 11.05. So they now do believe me, and I agree that it's very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down to where our apartment building's main front door is, but because there's also a shop right underneath us that always has those curtain slash roof things out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend and roommate would go to the balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. I have also asked my neighbors from my apartment if their doorbell also gets rang so often, but the ones that I asked said it never happened to them. So two weeks ago, my roommate decides to do some investigating and went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m. He stands across the street and pretended to have a smoke while keeping an eye on the door. He said he saw a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building, who slowed down his pace significantly as soon as he approached our door. But when he spotted my roommate looking at him, he quickly walked away. We aren't certain if this is the door ringer, but it was certainly was very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't been rung at night since that day, and I'm hoping that maybe it will stop now. 
but there is a possibility that it will start again in the next few weeks. If this keeps up, I will contact the police about it. I've been planning to ask more neighbors from other apartments next to ours if this is also happening to them. If it doesn't, I will call the cops. I however doubt that they'll do anything right now, since the coronavirus and all. The police will only respond to serious crimes or immediate threatening situations. In any case, creepy guy, let's not meet again. I recently started a job in a factory on swing shift, 4pm to 2am. I'm only two weeks in, but I can say right now that I do not feel safe there. I'm already an unimposing trans guy in a small conservative town, and I'm at the point where it's difficult to be stealthy, aka easy, obvious target. I also made the mistake of telling everyone that I used my preferred name, but didn't correct them on calling me she or her. I figured that correcting them on pronouns would make it even more obvious that I do not belong. Last night was my second night completely on my own. My first week was training on day shift. I got in the car and headed home around 2.15. It was an hour commute and right before I got on the highway, a truck got right up on my bumper and stayed there until I got into a well lit part of the next city. If I changed lanes, so did he. He kept his brights on the whole time, and he disappeared for a bit, and I hoped that he was just being an ass and that was that. I made my way across the city without incident, until I turned off onto the scenic route home from there. This guy comes up quickly behind me out of nowhere, until he's right up on my bumper again. Same deal as earlier, right behind, blinding me. I was definitely panicking at this point because no one else is on the road, and I know I'm the only one at work that lives in this town. He follows me for another five miles or so, then suddenly decides to make a sharp U-turn and book it out of there. I drove home as calmly as I could, drove around the police station a bit before finally going home. They didn't follow me the whole way. They must have gotten impatient after that half hour. I couldn't sleep at all and I do not feel safe going to work after that. I've tried calling human resources, but no one answered the phone. I don't have anyone else's number at work, and at that late at night, our small town police stations aren't even open. Anyone with advice, it would be greatly appreciated. This happened a few years ago, and we don't know exactly who this man was, but it still scared me senseless. When I was around 13, I used to have a bed right under my bedroom window. It was also around the time my dog was brought inside because she was too old to stay out. At the time, we didn't have a screen covering, and we now do. So the window could easily be opened and there was no barrier. I always left my window open during the day to let in fresh air, then close and lock it when it started getting dark. My house is surrounded by forest, not very thick, but still thick enough that you can't see clearly through it. It's completely normal hearing strange noises at night, because things like bears or stray dogs or even our former neighbor's chickens that would roam around our yard. So when I heard something shuffling around my window, I didn't pay it much mind and continued playing video games. Not 10 minutes later, I heard something hit against it. I thought it may have been a June bug, when they hit a window, they can sound like rocks, so I ignored it, and the knocking kept on going, but I just kept ignoring it, and it finally stopped. Fast forward to 2am. I was finally sitting down and going to sleep when I hear breathing. Very faint, enough to miss if my room wasn't silent. I heard something drag down my window, like a stick or a finger. It did it a few times, and that was enough for me. I jumped out of bed and ran to my dad's room. I told him that there was something at my window and he immediately came to look. We turned out the light so he could see better, but there was nothing. I told him what I heard and he said we would take a look in the morning. We did just that and my stomach churned. Under my window, there were two different foot tracks, one back and forth besides the generator 
and one that was back and forth directly under my window. There were even cigarette butts laying around near some bushes, like he had crouched there and waited. The foot tracks led towards the woods. We have neighbours that live through the woods and down the hill. They are very trashy. So we chalked it up to one of them coming up here drunk. Though what scared me the most about all this was the fact that when I went to open my window later that day, I found it was unlocked. I forgot to lock it the night before. I could have gotten in without issue. I woke up at night for a glass of water. I walked into the kitchen and ran into my dad. He walked right past me to the front door, didn't even acknowledge me being there. Where are you going? I asked him. He didn't say anything and just had a blank stare and walked out the door. I walked over and looked out the window, looked through the peephole, and we had a small walkway that connects to our driveway. He was sitting on the hallway hunched over, elbows on his knees under a big tree. That was in front of my bedroom, just staring into nothing. I walked into my mum's bedroom and asked her why dad was outside. She turned over and said, what do you mean he's right here? There was my dad, laying by my mum's side, in a deep sleep. This first started when I first moved into my new place, last summer in 2019. I live with my landlord, her elderly mum, and my friend Daisy. I also started a new job working night shifts at a hotel, so I was up most nights. I'm gonna preface this story with some background info that will help everything make sense. Since my landlord knew her neighbors very well, as she lived in this house all her life, and there is hardly any street parking, I was able to park in the vacant house's driveway, directly parallel across the street from ours. When I park my car, I can see the front of my place with my rear view mirrors. Our house is right in front of a very busy stop sign, so seeing slash hearing traffic is something we all have to get used to. Daisy and I identify as women and are best friends that met in college. We've known each other for a few years at this point and did everything together. I remember it was a warm summer Thursday night. Daisy and I loved to leave the house past midnight, eat terrible fast food, roll the windows down and drive along the coast. It was around 1.45 AM as I finally pulled up to my parking spot. We sat in the car for a while, listening to music and finishing the last bit of our late night munchies. My windows were up by this time, but we could hear a bigger car like a diesel approaching the stop sign. Of course, it was a stereotypical white van that prompted me to joke, Daisy, look at that creepy white van. From my rear view mirror, the next thing we knew, we saw what looked like a thin man pick up his camera from the passenger side and took at least five pictures of the front of our house with the flash on. Daisy and I silently looked at each other in horror as the van sped off. The next day, Daisy and I told our landlord about the incident and told us this was not the first time one of her tenants reported this. Though she brushed it off despite us telling her that anyone taking pictures of her house late at night did not have good intentions, it really put me and Daisy on edge. Some time has passed as the coronavirus pandemic crept its way into the US towards the end of 2019. I was gonna file a police report as I eventually caught most of the person's license plate after what felt like months of investigating. At the beginning of February 2020, the van stopped coming, which caused me to think the pandemic either may have gotten the person sick or affected them in some way. Although the person didn't take any more pictures as far as I saw, when the van drove by, it came from the same direction every time, around 1 to 1.30. It would stop for an eerily long amount of time and then would speed off out of nowhere, as if the person were racing another car that was never there. I did stop investigating after two weeks of nothing. I still get very anxious if I hear a loud diesel-like vehicle drive by late at night. I don't know what the person wanted or why they were taking pictures of my landlord's house. Maybe once quarantine is lifted, I might investigate again to ensure that the creep 
comes no more for his late night visits. This happened back in 2016 on Christmas Eve night. We had just gotten back from my sisters and were sitting in the car for a few minutes. It was fairly cold. Keep this in mind. Also, side note, we had a bunch of cats, so at first we hadn't thought anything of it. We sat there for about 10 minutes and heard rustling. Not thinking anything about it, because of the cats, we blew it off. When not a minute later, we heard it again. My mum just so happened to look up, and there was a bald man in a vest and shorts. My mum and I both had that uneasy feeling because of his choice of clothing. It was 32 degrees, and he's in summertime clothes. Very strange. My mum has her window cracked, and he was barely a foot away from our car. My mum yelled out to him and said to back away from the vehicle, which surprisingly he didn't. He continued to stand there and stare at us. My mum decided to try and scare him, so she yelled out to him that she was armed and would blow him away. She didn't have her firearm on her though. She definitely made sure he thought he did. He threw up his hands but continued to approach the car. So my mum threw her phone to me and told me to dial 911. I told the dispatcher what was going on and she said she'd have the police there right away. My mother proceeded to try and run him down, but he went between two porches so that our car wouldn't fit. Finally, about half hour later, the cops show up and took our statement. The station, bear in mind, was literally down the road, and if he'd actually have tried something, I knew his intentions were real willed even if he had run away. So I was very annoyed that cops took so long to show up. They stayed and looked everywhere for him, but it came out empty. My mum nor I slept that night, or finished opening presents because of the fear he would return. The police thought maybe he wanted to steal the gifts that were in the car, but we'll never know. The scariest part is months later, it came to light he had escaped jail. He was put there for assault, so who knows what he would have done to my mother and I. During a road trip from New Jersey to North Carolina, my friend and I decided we were hungry and went looking for food in a town in Maryland. I don't really remember the name of the town, but it felt very strange as soon as we pulled onto the main road, as there didn't seem to be any people out and about. It was the middle of the day, but no one was walking around. There weren't any restaurant food options other than the pizza place. So we pulled up and parked in front of it. It seemed like everyone in the town must have gone to the pizza place. And when we parked the car, everyone in the restaurant turns and looks at our car through the big glass windows. Like at the same time, they stared at us. We stared at them. It felt so weird that I said, I don't want to go in there. My friend just nodded at me wide eyed and we drove to another town for lunch. Why was seemingly the whole town in that pizza place? What was with the staring? I'm almost a little sorry we didn't go in and find out. But at the same time, not sorry at all. This happened in an old farmhouse a few miles away from where I live. And the case is unsolved today. I live in Bavaria, Germany. It's an area with a lot of mountains and forests. This incident happened over a hundred years ago. The family who lived in the farmhouse, along with its two workers, experienced many strange paranormal things, like foot trails and the snow, which just led to nowhere, a few meters to the edge of the forest, perhaps, and strange sounds at night, and the youngest daughter, was telling the family that she was often visited by a tall man at night. One morning, the whole family was found dead in their beds. Everyone had their heads smashed in with a blunt object. There were no signs that someone broke in and the doors were all locked when the police arrived. Nothing was taken from the family, not even the gold necklace that the mother owned, which was right beside her bed and should be obvious if it were a burglary. The police also stated 
that there had been a lot of hate involved in the crime due to the brutality. The police investigated the crime scene, but didn't find anything. Another weird thing that happened in the barn. They locked it to investigate it later because there wasn't anything remarkable at first. But when they later returned, there was a rope with that hanging knot hanging from the ceiling. No one knew how it got there. Well, the case is around a hundred years old, and if it happened nowadays, the police probably would be able to solve it with modern technology. But the paranormal things surrounding the house really creeped everyone out. I've never visited the farmhouse, but many stay it's still haunted. I'm not sure about that personally. A little backstory. I was a strip dancer for six years. I worked in many cities and clubs. At the time of this story, I wasn't a rookie. I was very well versed in the industry. At the time this took place, I was about 20 or 21. It was also in Texas at one of the upscale clubs. And I never imagined something like this would happen in this place, but apparently I was wrong. I started my shift at 6 p.m. I like to get there early, meet some of my regulars before the crowd came in. It was about 8.30 to 9, and this really good looking Kai came in with some friends. They were all older, 40 to 45. I grabbed some of my hustle friends and we went and sat with them. It wasn't hard to convince these guys into a VIP room with bottled service, but this is where it went kind of weird. The guy I was talking to wanted a separate room just for us. I thought maybe because his friend seemed rowdy and wanting to party hard, he wanted to have a more relaxed area. I wasn't complaining because that meant I wouldn't have to share my cut of the room. So stupid me saw dollar signs and went in. We got two bottles of Dom Perignon, some mixed drinks and shots. Now, a lot of these guys that come into the clubs really want to let loose and brought substances too. These guys had just about everything and I was definitely a party girl at the time. So I partook in some of these, but I also wasn't stupid. So at the time we were all hanging out in one room together. I took a little hit of something and continued drinking. After we were all hyped up and ready to party, my guy pulled me over into the other room. This guy was 6'4", obviously worked out a lot and was attractive. I, on the other hand, without my heels, was 5'6", and like 120. I sat on his lap and started talking to him and laying my moves down to get him to empty his wallet. We were having a really good conversation, and my bouncers were really good about checking up on the girls in the rooms, because they are pretty secluded on the second floor. After 20 minutes of talking, something snapped. And all of a sudden, he literally puts his hands around my neck, lifted me up and slammed me against the back of the couch. The couch backs were tall and padded, so it wouldn't have been heard on the other side without the music. I was frozen in fear. After almost three years of dancing, I'd never been in this situation. He started calling me names, spat in my face, and his grip around me would get tighter. He would then feel me take a deep breath like I was going to scream. Luckily, there were also VIP rooms across the large overlook, and a bouncer noticed me kicking and flailing. I faintly remember all of the bouncers running into the room. They had to pry me out of his hands. When I was finally back sitting on the couch, they had him on the floor outside the room, and his buddies acted like they didn't even know him. My manager grabbed me and carried me like a baby to the dressing room, asked if I needed any medical, and I said no and that I was just shaken up. His buddies talked to my manager and basically gave me guilt money for this happening. Apparently he was going through some rubbish divorce and snapped on me instead of his ex. I have an 100 pound German shepherd who's pretty friendly. So while walking him in my neighborhood one day, this guy comes running up to me and accuses me of being a cop because I have such a large cop-like dog. Not realizing the level of crazy I was about to be exposed to, I politely said no and continued to walk my dog. This continued to escalate over the next few weeks. 
Every time I saw this guy, he would accuse me of being a cop. Following behind me and constantly babbling about he knew I was there to take his stash. And if I just would follow him into his house, he would show them to me. Then one day I start to notice he apparently is now camping out all night long in the playground outside my house, while swinging a sock with a rock in it. At this point I had called the cops, and they told me there was nothing they could do. It only got worse after that. Every time I left my house to go to my car, which was parked out in front of my house, he would come running from the playground or from the front stoop of his house, screaming that he knew I was a cop and that I couldn't catch him. So I called the cops again. They came out to talk to the family and said he apparently is very disturbed and there isn't anything they can do. The final straw was when he decided to yell veiled death threats into his cell phone while running to beat me to my car while I left for work one day. When I told the cops and told them about the death threats, they showed up in force, arrested him, as apparently he was wanted for various things. I used to really enjoy driving around at night, especially because round where I live, there are lots of country roads and they were fun to zip around. One evening after I'd been at a friend's house, I decided to drive to my church, about a half hour away from home, and back just listening to music. The route is one I've done most Sundays for 17 years being driven, and I have been driving it for about four years at this point. So even in the dark, I felt fine to drive the speed limit, which is 60. I got maybe a quarter of a mile there, and my stomach started twisting. I knew that if I kept on going, I regret it. But I shook it off. It wasn't late and the weather was fine. I wasn't going to miss this driving opportunity. But as I got further, the feeling in my stomach got worse, and I realized I had to turn around. Just before I reached the hill pass that's about halfway to the church, I pulled a U-turn and went home and stopped feeling so anxious and forgot about it. The next day, I woke up and got in my car to go to church to find my usual route had been closed. Turned out that on the hill pass, the road had crumbled away, leaving a sheer drop that would have been around a blind bend for me. The road issue had been called in by a driver going the opposite direction to me about five minutes after I had pulled a Yui and driven away. I'd definitely have been, at the very least, badly hurt had I kept on going. I got my first job at 15, working in the local convenience store for under the table paychecks until I turned 16 so they could legally hire me. They needed staff they could underpay and I needed money to support my family. Plus, the store was literally 10 minutes from my house, so I could go home for lunch or go jogging in the field next to the store. I'm a very friendly person and loved to make conversation because it helped the day go by faster. One morning, a guy in his late 20s to early 30s came into the store to receive a click and collect package and the system was being really slow, so I asked him about his previous evening. It had been Guy Fawkes night, so it was my topic of conversation with everyone that day. He didn't appear to want to talk much, and so I overcompensated with my own talking. So there wasn't any awkward silence while the parcels were scanning, and I told him about how my dog hates fireworks, so I stayed inside with him. He then asked me when the store closes, which so many people at my store do, that I didn't find this information weird. I told him, it was going to close at 3 p.m. because it's Sunday. He left with his parcels, and I literally didn't think of him at all again. I took my break at midday and went on my usual laps around the field after getting rid of my work uniform. And as it was fairly cold, no one else was on the field. I'm on the opposite side and I look to my left because I'm dramatically singing along to Hamilton with my headphones in and there's some guy sitting alone on the children's swing set in the park. Because it's pretty cold, and I'm embarrassed by feeling watched, I finished my jog there and finished my break inside the stockroom drinking tea. Again, this didn't faze me, because there are always weirdos hanging around my area, and many of them I know, 
because of how close the community is. I finished my shift at four, after cleaning and restocking for the next day, and was let out through the back exit car park that was shared with a dilapidated pub. Funnily enough, that one I have many childhood memories of before it closed down, because my parents and I have lived on this estate our entire lives. Some guy was sitting on the wall there with his coat hood pulled up. This was slightly strange, because nothing around the area was open, and hadn't been for at least an hour, especially not the pub, but I was 15, and I'd taken the same walk down the main road every single shift without issue. I put my headphones in with a slight pinch of anxiety, because as soon as I moved past this guy, I saw him jump up from the wall from the corner of my eye. I don't put music on, I just listen to his footsteps follow me, until he's next to me, and gesturing for me to remove my headphones. As you probably guessed, it's the same guy from the morning shift. I'm quite confused at this point, because it's the first time I'd seen him in my local store. We have a lot of regulars, and I would even know most of them by address because we saved everyone's newspaper, but I'd never seen him before. I only encountered him twice in one day. I removed my headphones and asked what he wanted. He asked me for the time, and I assumed, because we live on a council estate, that perhaps he was going to mug me. It's happened before. I told him 4pm without taking my phone out. Then he proceeds to pretend he only just recognized me from the store, and tells me he thought I finished at 3. I've watched enough true crime to be guessing he'd waited for me to finish my shift for an hour. I was having a mild panic attack at this point, because it was a lazy cold Sunday, so nobody was around, and I wasn't yet at the main road. So I continued to talk with him while he questioned me about how long I'd worked there at the store. I know it's stupid to engage, but he was keeping my pace right next to me, and the main road was only down the street, where I thought our paths would diverge. He asked me if I worked there all the time, and in an effort to dissuade him from trying to hit on me, I told him I was still studying, although I would not tell him at which institution. My being a minor didn't seem to quite deter him. Mind you, at the age I am now, being 20, I just look about 15. Like I said, he was undeterred and tried asking for my number, in which I told him I didn't have a phone, an obvious lie because my headphones were plugged into them, and I was tightly gripping my pocket. He brought this up, and I told him that I shared a phone, but I didn't have my own. Despite this being an obvious lie, he continued. I was on the main road now, but he had not stopped talking, and my quickest way home, the path I usually took, was through a dark wooded area, and then a shady parking lot. I opted for the longer way to keep myself on public roads, so he wouldn't know where my house was located. He asked for my Facebook, and I desperately wanted to get away from him at this point, so I thought if I gave him my Facebook and then changed my name, as soon as I had the chance, he would be unable to find me. I don't know why I just didn't give him a fake name. I was young and stupid, and honestly was just scared that no cars had passed yet and he was still tailing me. After this, I asked him which way he lived, and he told me only a short while up ahead, and asked me if I was interested in coming along with him. I said I live in this other direction, and would say goodbye now, but that we could speak again later. I know I'm an idiot, but I thought if he thought I was interested in speaking to him, he would leave me alone and because of my experience in talking to people in this job, this came off very casually and truthfully. It worked. I crossed the road, and as soon as I was out of sight, I legged it back down to the other side of the road and got home. When home, I went to change my name, but found he had already messaged me. Although, I had not told him my middle name, that was a part of my Facebook, which he brought up to me in his first message. I messaged him back explaining I had no interest in him, and instantly blocked his account. I felt so stupid for even letting him have my real name, that I couldn't bring myself to tell my parents. Instead I asked my brother to meet me at the store at the end of my shifts. It was only Sundays I finished an hour late because I wanted them to help me pick out ingredients for dinner that night. My first shift back, 
He was waiting outside in the same area, but my brother was with me, and we went around the front way so I could see him waiting there, but didn't have to walk past him. After this, I decided I couldn't keep getting escorts home and told my work I needed to leave at different times in case he followed me. They wanted to tell authorities, but I refused because it was a relatively small thing and I was working illegally there and didn't want to get them in trouble. I told my parents, and they told a few people in the neighborhood to be wary. I started getting the bus home from school because I was worried he had my Facebook and now knew where I went to school. The next time I saw him, he came into the store again to collect parcels. I told my manager next to me and she served him while also telling him they could call someone if he continued to harass me. I was scared about all the information he now had from my Facebook because I was a young kid and my privacy settings were crap and held my country, my school, hundreds of my pictures with friends in my neighborhood, at the school I was going to, and all of them were tagged. Fortunately, nothing more happened after this. I saw him once on the bus with my mother a year later, and this was while I was in college and at a shopping center. I'd quit my job a little while after this to work elsewhere legally when I turned 16 to earn more money, and I live in a different city now. He doesn't scare me anymore, but I definitely am way more private about my life on social media. Everything is on private, and I don't provide my real information for certain sites. This was a little story about my experience having a minor stalker. Obviously, I still blame myself for being dumb and having all my private information out there, but I still thought it would be an interesting thing to share. My name is Thomas. I'm a 33-year-old man that lives in Baltimore City, better known as Beemore or Bodymore in the urban area where it's dangerous. But when you live your whole life somewhere, you tend to adapt to your area. The following story happened five years ago when I was 28. I was walking to my buddy's place at about 10 p.m. to buy some green. His house was about a 15-minute walk away, and on the way back, I nipped into the store because I had my cousin's independence card, so I definitely was going to buy some munchies for a post-smoke snack. But on my way back, I saw a white car drive past me and pulled up a side street a block away. Mind you, I had my earphones in, but didn't have anything playing in case someone tried anything funny. When I got to the block where the car was, a guy hopped out the car and tried to catch up with me. I started to feel unnerved by his ever-growing proximity, and when he was within earshot, I heard him utter something. I then took out one of the earbuds, and with an annoyed tone said, What do you want? He instantly shot me a fierce reply, to not speak to him that way, and it was at that moment I saw a silver firearm that he was clutching in his coat. I had a bag of junk food in my hand, and a bag of green in my shoe. Without missing a beat, he said, where's the money? I then realized I was being robbed. I stopped in my tracks. I don't have any money, I've just got this bag of green. It was at that moment when someone else hopped out the car. He was armed too, and went onto the right side of me. I was now standing with two armed men at either side of me and did the only logical thing I could think of. I took off my shoe and threw the bag of green to the ground while sputtering, that's all I've got. With a fierce reply, he shouted at me to put my shoe back on. As I started to, I looked around. There were plenty of people watching me nearby, watching all of this go down. The guy on the left then went, yo, if you don't pull out a dollar, I'ma shoot you. My fight or flight kicked in. With no money on me at all and nothing to appease the robbers unsatisfied with their loot, I pulled my pants up a little more because I was preparing to run. And before I could say anything else, sprinted up the street. I was only three minutes away from my house. As I bolted, I passed people wearing crazy expressions as they'd seen the entire ordeal. When I got two blocks from my house, I ran through a parking lot 
and headed by a gate that had a lot of high bushes and trees, and caught my breath because I couldn't run anymore. But I didn't stay long, because I was still scared and didn't know if I was still being chased. So I got the hell up and jogged the rest of the way to my house. Once I composed myself and made sure I wasn't followed, I sat down and told my little eight-year-old cousin just how dangerous it was at night in Baltimore City after dark. Oddly enough, I was telling him earlier that day how dangerous it was, and telling him a story of how I was robbed on another occasion. Safe to say, I no longer try and go out after dark. This didn't happen to me, but my friend. Back in 1998, I was at second grade and was coming home from school alone for the first time. I had a bit of overprotective parents since I lived about a block away from my school, and I was stopped by an elderly woman who said she had something to tell me. She said she had no husband, had lost her son years ago, and just wanted to give me a hug. Something about this woman gave me the creeps, and now later on, thinking she did look and talk a bit weird, almost like she was a man dressed in old woman's clothes. But this could really just have been my juvenile imagination messing around. After asking me for a hug, she reached her hands towards me and motioned for wanting a hug. I took off and ran as fast as I could all the way home. As I ran, I heard her laughing really loud in a low, manly laugh. When I got home, I told my mum about it, but she wasn't worried at all and told me that it was probably just an old and lonely woman who needed a hug. Here in Finland, we have this magazine called Alibi, which has the most recent news about burglaries, thefts, and all manner of terrible, terrible things. And for some reason, eight-year-old me was not allowed to go anywhere near this magazine, obviously. But a few weeks after the incident with the old woman, I did get my hands on a copy, which was brand new. I read about an incident that happened in the area in which I lived, about a boy my age last seen by his friends hugging an old woman and walking somewhere with her never to be seen again. The case is still unsolved today, 15 years later, and it gives me the shivers, as that could have been me. But I feel for that poor, poor boy. It was about 1.45 p.m. in Houston, Texas. I was driving to my job as a nanny about 15 minutes away from my house. Currently, I was less than a minute away from my house, in my car waiting at a red light. The light turned green, and I accelerated as you do. While I was reaching the end of the intersection and a car from the cross lane of traffic, ran his red light and darted in front of me. So quickly, I didn't have any time to brake at all. I hit him going at roughly 15 to 20, and immediately he got out his car and gestured for me to unlock my passenger side door, which I did because I was frazzled, having just gotten into a car accident. He immediately opened his door and started spinning a tail. Listen. I'm an off-duty police officer chasing a suspect. Didn't you see me? No, I said, because he hadn't been chasing anyone. Traffic was slow since we were in a residential area and no other cars had decided to run a red light. Didn't you see my lights? No, because he didn't have any lights. He was in an older model SUV or minivan, not a police car. Keep in mind, he also wasn't in any sort of uniform, just a blue shirt and jeans. He was very thin, between the ages of 40 to 50, and had no police gear with him. Well, I can call 911 and have you arrested, he said. I had right of way, I told him, since my light was green, and I'm gonna need to see some ID. I'm proud to say that I, despite being a short girl, was decidedly unfriendly. I am absolutely not trying to get scammed on my way to work, bud. He gave me a look like, wow, I can't believe this idiot is asking me for ID. Listen, I'm undercover. I'm with the feds. So in the span of 30 seconds, he's risen from a member of the Houston PD to an undercover federal agent. Right. 
I'm going to need to see some ID. I'm undercover. My life and operation will be at risk if you don't comply. Your life is in danger. There are people watching me right now. I stared back at him unimpressed. My mother has told me multiple times, ever since I was a baby, I've been able to communicate with a single expression how little I care for the lives of others. I was giving him that look, the one that says, why does a simple ant think he has the right to speak to me? I'm going to need some ID and insurance, I insisted. Now, having apparently given up, he noticed that my purse was on the passenger seat. Keep in mind he's leaning through the passenger door, which I had foolishly unlocked for him. Having thought this was going to be a normal car accident, he reached for it now, grabbing the canvas of the bag as opposed to the leather handle. I'm going to need this, he began. But I interrupted, grabbing my purse in a death grip. I may be small, but my grip is about the same strength as a pit bull, and there's no way I was going to let him hit my car and then have the audacity to steal my purse. No, you don't. Yes, I need to see ID so that I can report you. I don't even remember what bogus lies he told me. He was rambling at this point. He told me something about pretending to be a pimp. He needed me to pretend to give him money. His family was at risk. I don't know. At one point, he almost looked close to tears, which frankly was a bit much. There is absolutely no reason you need my purse and you will not be getting it. You can't have it. If you're a federal agent, give me ID. I was gripping my purse so firmly, my fingers were turning white from pressure. I kept glancing at where my cell phone was in the cup holder, but I didn't think I'd be quick enough to grab it and dial for the real police before he took it. He didn't ever try to jerk it from my grip, which is probably good because I would have straight up lost it to him. My car was still on and still drivable, and I'm not even joking when I say that I would have run his dumb ass down. He finally let go. Fine. Let's meet at the nearest gas station. The one across the street? I asked. No, the one down the road. Can I trust you to meet me there? Yes, of course. I lied unconvincingly. I'm a good liar, don't get me wrong. But I wasn't even trying to act like I was going to meet him. I just wanted him to get out of my car. I was already thinking of the damages and how much it would cost. And if he wanted to take what little money I had, he would have to pry it from my cold, mortis rigged fingers one by one, because I would never let him have it. Okay, I'll meet you at the gas station down the road. Can I trust you not to go to the police? He said. Yeah, fine. He finally left, entered his vehicle and started it up. He tried to have me go first, but I was having none of it. And I gestured him and he gestured me and I was still wearing that absolute deadpan face. I was already on the phone with the police when he turned down the street that led to the gas station, and I obviously passed him and drove straight to the nearest police station as the operator advised me. I actually wasn't scared during this process. I'm someone who tends to get unnaturally calm during a crisis, but I was completely calm while making the statement with the police not 20 minutes later. But of course, as soon as I walk out the police station, I just broke down sobbing. I wouldn't say this is the scariest thing that's ever happened to me, but it was scary because I'd recently moved to Houston and all my family and extended family lives in Washington state. So I felt alone. I live with my aunt and cousin, but I have three siblings and 15 cousins and 17 aunts and uncles and a whole host of extended family in Washington. And I never realized how safe I felt in my small town until I was almost robbed in the big city. Also, since I'm paranoid and listen to a lot of true crime media, I parked my car a few streets over from my house and walked home. He had mentioned something about me living in the neighborhood that was within walking distance of the car accident, as well as trying to convince me I knew him somehow, which was strange and also stupid as I legitimately don't know anyone in Houston. In any case, I'm grateful that nothing more happened with this incident. Thank you for listening. And beware of dumb drivers that hit you with your car and then try to take things from you. Remember, you can always ask a cop for ID and do not let anyone take anything from you without there being good reason for it. As a child, think kindergarten age, I love to talk. 
if anyone had a question for me, I would gleefully give them way too much information. Most people found it endearing and would praise me for being so smart, which encouraged me a lot. My mum and I normally shopped at the market just a few minutes away from our house. My mum had been shopping there for 20 some years at that point, and I was friends with most of the workers. So I was friendly with them too, and as always, was happy to talk to them. Whenever my mum got distracted talking to someone, I, with the intention span of a six-year-old, would wander around the aisle. My mum would keep an eye to make sure I didn't get too far. But if she was distracted, one of the employees would usually be around and gently guide me back over. One day though, we went to a different market that I couldn't remember having been to before and we didn't go back to for nearly a decade. We were walking around the aisles when my mum ran into her friend. They started talking and I, not realizing that I no longer had a store full of adults keeping an eye on me, started wandering around the aisle. My eye caught some colorful display, I think flowers or balloons or something, and I went over to look. Once I was satisfied with my inspection, I turned back to the aisle only to find that my mum wasn't there. Strange, that never happened before. I looked around a little, although not moving from my spot near the colorful display, since it was right near the registers and there were a decent amount of people nearby, which I'm now thankful for. As I was looking around, an employee came up to me. He was older than my sister, as she was around 12 or 13 at the time, and younger than my dad in his mid 40s, which was about the only way I could gauge age. Now I would say he was probably in his early to mid 20s. Hi there, he said sweetly, in that tone you normally speak to kids in. I cheerfully said hello, actually stepping a little closer. Are you looking for your mummy? I say yes, happily explaining that I had last seen her talking to her friend and that I could normally find her easily when I wandered away. So I wasn't sure where she could have gone. Does she leave you alone often? Not really. My older sister was normally with me if my mum wasn't. She was 12 and she was super mature. So if my mum had to leave me for a bit, she knew I'd be okay. And she never left us alone in public just at home if she needed to run somewhere. And my dad was at work a lot and didn't come back until late usually, just if you were wondering. Where do you live? Well, wouldn't you know it, I'd even learned my address. We just learned how to mail a letter in school and even took a little class trip to the mailbox on our school corner to send them out. I know how to write my address now and I knew how to say it. Do you want to hear it? Of course you do. I know kids are naive, but I was downright dumb. I was diagnosed with deutal color blindness two years later, otherwise known as red green color blindness. Makes sense, as I was totally blind to all the red flags. Where do you go to school? Who picks you up? Well, I go to the local elementary school. I don't know the address though, sorry but I knew what street it was on because I walked the sidewalk from my mum's or daycare sitter, depending on the day. So I see the street sign a lot since I'm usually waiting for a while to be grabbed. Do you like animals? Do you like puppies? Dogs scare me, cats scare me, pigeons scare me, fish scare me, flies scare me. You know what doesn't scare me though? Turtles. I have five. No dogs that might bark or bite if someone drops the house like our neighbors does. The dogs are always behind the gate though, so they don't scare me a lot. I'd only been a few minutes since I last saw my mum, even with how much information I was dumping, as I was a fast talker. But I was starting to get a little antsy, not because I was uncomfortable speaking to strangers, but because I had skipped lunch that day, specifically to con my mum into letting me get a bagel from the store next door, which was why we were at the market in the first place. My mum was holding onto the bagel to make sure I didn't try and eat it too fast to choke, which I had done several times in the past. I wanted my bagel, and while I liked talking to this grown man who made me feel smart and was oh so interested in my life, I loved bagels more. 
Plus, if I caught my mom when we were near the bakery section, I might be able to use my charm and cuteness to get a cookie. So I gotta find my mum now. Oh, well I'll walk around with you to help you find her. You wanna lead me through the market you work at, where you can easily bring me to the back room, meat locker, or any number of places? Sounds good. That's when I heard it. Ozzy. I look around to see my mum. The relieved look on her face slowly change into something more anxious. I smile happily and wave over to her. She immediately grabs my hand and I can tell she wants to chide me, probably for leaving the aisle, but she seems more occupied on the man in front of me. Before I can even open my mouth to introduce him or remember that I never got his name, he quickly says he's glad I found my mum and he needs to get back to work and practically runs to the back of the store. My mum puts her hand on my shoulder and looks me in the eye her expression a lot more worried now. What was he talking to you about? She asks, her voice more serious than I'd ever heard. Can I have my bagel? My mom opens her mouth, pauses, and goes into her purse to hand me my bagel. Between bites, I happily tell her about the conversation and everything I remembered, my age, grades, pickup schedule, likes, dislikes, and my literal address. My mom gradually became paler, then became red with anger. She brought me over to the manager and I don't remember much about that conversation. I got a cookie, I remember that pretty well. It was shaped like a watermelon, which was apparently far more important to me than paying attention to what was being said. The police weren't called. We went home and my mum told me I wasn't allowed to walk around the store anymore. No more talking to any strangers, even if they worked at the store we were at, unless she was with me. If I ever saw that man again, I was to run away, to find someone I knew and ask for help. If all else fails, to scream at the top of my lungs, just like I would when a fly would land on me. God, insects are creepy. I agreed pleasantly, not really phased by anything she said. And I know that some people are bad, but bad people look bad, right? They talk mean, they look scary and try to grab you. This guy didn't, so he wasn't bad, was he? But if my mum was saying it, then I'd listen. And I'd better enjoy that cookie because we weren't going back to that store ever again. In exchange, I can get a donut once a month from our annual store. When I was around 12, our school had a safety assembly. And we're talking about the shady things adults do to get kids close. And a very watered down version of what they most likely wanted. And I'm sitting there, listening and suddenly realize. Oh, if my mum hadn't found me, something bad might have happened. If not in the store, then in front of the school. And if not in the front of my school, then my home. A little over a decade later, and I've never seen the man again. Let's keep it that way. This happened about two years ago and still scares me when I think about it. First, a little background. My name's Jesse and I live in the UK and I'm from a smallish area, nothing fancy. I'm 18 and at the time of this story, I was 16 and working at a family friend's pub collecting glasses. I'd work from seven till 11 at night and lived about a half an hour away to 45 minutes. To get home, I had to walk through a park. Now, this park has three entrances, two at the top and one at the bottom, which leads into the town slash center and main shopping area. The top two lead to two different areas. One is a skate park and the other is literally right next to a comprehensive school and a big field. This school has a lot of bushes and trees in it and only has a few lights. The only lights are on the lamp posts outside each entrance to the park, which are very dimly lit. Each entrance was a big gate and they were always open. It's important to note this for later. I had to walk the path that leads towards the school since it was the fastest way home. Now onto the story. I worked at the pub for a year and had stuck to the same routine going home. I'd leave around 11 
sometimes a few minutes before something, sometimes a few minutes before, sometimes a few minutes after. And it took about 10 minutes to get to the park, so I'd be walking through the park at around half 11, give or take. Now the one entrance I had to use to get into the park was the one at the bottom, the one that leads to the shopping area. It had one lamppost outside the gate, and that was it. That was the only light, so I could see about 10 foot into the park, and there was a few benches. No one was ever in the park when I walked through it from work. During the autumn slash winter weeks, it was always empty. Even the streets were. So you could imagine my shock when I saw a man sitting on the bench as I walked through the park gates. Now this was so strange. Around quarter to midnight, almost 12, it's pitch black and freezing. And this dude is just chilling on the bench. I couldn't see him too well at first, but as I got closer, I got a good look at him. He was young, 20 to 25, long hair and a ponytail, but not a scruffy one. It was tight and neat. He had a hoop earring and his nose was pierced. I couldn't remember his eye color. He was so pale with jet black hair with red tips, which went past his shoulders. He wore all black and dressed a bit like an emo. Looking back now, he reminds me and kind of looks like Dracula from the movie Van Helsing. He was on his phone and looked up at me as I walked towards him. And he just stared at me as I walked past. I gave him a slight courteous nod and smile and carried on going. He just looked me up and down with a smirk, which unsettled me. He didn't say anything and I managed to get home and didn't think much of it and forgot all about it. The next night I went to work, I finished my shift and walked through the park. And again, there he was. He was on his phone, wearing all black hair and a ponytail. He looked up to see me and smiled. I smiled back, but walked a bit faster past him. Again, he said nothing. This happened the next night, but on the fourth, he wasn't there. I walked through the park as usual, but I felt so uneasy. It was pitch black, no lights except for the moon. And what do I hear? Footsteps, quick footsteps behind me. So I turn around and see nothing. I wasn't taking any chances though. So I ran through the park and I swear over the sound of my heart beating fast and my footsteps, I could hear the sound of twigs snapping and leaves crunching. After that, I started getting a lift home for about two weeks from a friend. Then, that friend went on vacation. So I had to start walking home through the park again. The first night, which was Monday, the man wasn't there, but I still felt uneasy, like I was being watched. And on the second, he was, sitting on that same bench, smiling at me. But this time, he spoke in a very deep voice. Hey, baby, love the tights and skirt. Damn. I was wearing a black skirt and sheer tights with thick black thigh high socks and Doc Martens with a black biker jacket and a thick scarf. I had to wear all black for work and I looked at him awkwardly, smiled and hurried away. The next few weeks, he'd be in the park and made lewd comments and always sat on the bench. I'd try and get lifts home where I could, but there would always be times I'd need to go through the park. Lord, I hated that walk. One night, things escalated. I walked through the park as usual, and again he was there, sitting, smiling at me. I did my best to ignore him, and he made comments about my body, and what he wanted to do to me. As I was walking away, I was out of the light, and could only see two to three feet in front of me. I must have been about 20 feet away when I hear running behind me and turn around. Someone runs at me at full speed and knocks me to the floor. I feel a heavy weight on me and instantly I feel hair on my face and a hand over my mouth. A familiar deep voice in front of me tells me not to fight it and that if I don't, it'll be over quicker. That's when his hands start to wander. I can hear his zipper and that's when I know what's coming. 
He's mentioning how he's been waiting to do this for so long. And he took his hand off my mouth, and that's when I took my chance and bit him really hard. He screamed. He sat up, and I could barely see what I was doing. But I took that opportunity and pushed him off me, and started to run, and heard him running after me. I got to the first gate that I usually leave by, and was mortified to see it was locked. I could see it had a lock on it, because the lamppost on the other side shone onto the usually open gate. I was so confused, but I could hear him shouting, and started to run again, and I ran towards the other gate. It was closed, but not all the way, there was a small gap, and I just squeezed through it, leading to the skate park. He tried to grab me, and I turned and looked at him for a few seconds, catching my breath. He stared at me and then started to try and fit through the gate, so I booked it as fast as I could. I ran towards the skate path path. The skate park was full of bushes on one side of the path that ran through it. It also had a long dark path, which after about 20 minutes leads to a main road, but it's usually completely empty. I ran through the skate park and hid in the bushes waiting for him, since if I had run onto the path, I'd be visible and he'd be able to see me and chase me, and since no one was around, I'd stand no chance. The path that leads to the road had very few lights, but still had enough, so he'd see me and be able to follow me. I sat in the bush, hiding, hand over my mouth. I sat there for a minute when I saw him running through the skate park looking for me. He slowed down near the exit path, which led to a long path, and he stood there for a minute just sniffing the air. No joke, he was sniffing it. His hair wasn't in a ponytail anymore. It was all over him. He wasn't wearing a coat. He wore a long sleeved shirt that was all black. It was winter, which confused me since it was so damn cold. And he looked around and I felt his eyes scan me. Then he kept looking and started walking down the long path. After about 10 minutes, I felt it was safe and ran back towards the park, and ran into the park and ran to the gate I usually go through to get home. It was still locked, so I just climbed over it. I walked towards the school following the path I always used to, and had a strange urge to look back. And there he was. At the gate, the man was just standing, just watching me. He laughed and said, I'll catch you one day, baby girl, mark my words. He blew me a kiss and walked away into the darkness. I've never been so scared in all my life. I booked it home and told my mom what happened. She called the police and council and asked why the fence was locked. The council were just as confused as we were because the gate was never supposed to be locked, ever. The police couldn't do much. They put a warning out and that was about it. The creepy thing was, he had to have learned my pattern. He had to have known I used the park every night to get home. It creeps me out to this day, knowing I was being watched and could have been assaulted or worse. I still have nightmares from time to time about him, and wonder what would have happened to me had I not gotten away, or had he seen me in the bushes. I stopped working at the pub, and haven't used the park since. Everyone has that one set of neighbors that you love to hate. They're always partying late into the crack of dawn, throwing their trash on your side of the yard, asking to borrow things or other such acts. Not to gatekeep having bad neighbors, but I feel like the years of hell these neighbors have caused my family were way worse than most normal awful neighbors. I'll let you decide. It's hard to condense so much into a few short paragraphs, and even still, I feel like this story will be sort of long. Setting-wise, a house across from Mars was up for rent, and this would become the gateway to hell that ensues. We knew the person who owned the house, so some of this would be stuff she told us afterwards. The first signs of trouble started when they moved in, driving their moving truck onto the driveway and parking a nice Lexus on the lawn. 
For the kind of people that would come to live there, Alexis was definitely suspect. But parking cars on the lawn became a daily habit that killed it over time. Another red flag was the number of people that came and went as the weeks went by. No one knew the true amount of people that actually lived there, but the regulars were as follows. An overweight blonde, think Walmart shopper but uglier, a somewhat more decent brunette with glasses. She was a less frequent visitor, but we did see her often. A hideous rat looking punk boy that couldn't have been older than 18. A teenage twig girl who looked like she was doing some devious stuff in her spare time and appeared anemic and two small toddlers, a boy and a girl. This new addition to the neighborhood quickly claimed their spot as the loudest people in the neighborhood with seemingly endless parties and arguments that would last for hours at a time. They had the foulest mouths you could ever imagine, and even the youngest child could be heard saying words that no young person should ever be exposed to. Though the days were nice, we couldn't open our windows unless we wished to hear the vulgar music that was blasting through the open garage door as one of the teens worked on a dented shell of a car every evening. A real selling point was the small toddlers would be left outside in the front yard to fend for themselves for hours on end. These people were clearly living on welfare and other such government programs, and the most annoying thing they did Come the first full month they were there, ask us for things. The brunette lady was, more often than not, the one who showed up at our door, often with a child on her hip or one in tow behind her. The requests weren't anything weird at first. Sugar, eggs, and my mum was too nice to refuse. Then they became more strange. They asked for diapers, an electric girdle to make grilled cheese, which they did surprisingly return. And once they asked if they could charge their phone for a bit, I guess they were a bit behind on their bills and their electricity got shut off. Some things like that would happen a lot more frequently in the future. The highlight of this story has yet to come. All of this pales in comparison to what happened next. It was a hot summer's day, one that makes you feel like you're moving in slow motion and can't think properly. I just happened to look outside and to my horror, I witnessed the young teen girl dragging a screaming toddler into the house after he'd been running around outside by himself and shut the mesh door behind her. I could still make out the figure of the girl who began to call the child all sorts of obscenities. I quickly called my mother who stormed outside telling her to stop what she'd call the police. The girl called her a nosy so-and-so and shut the front door. Just as my mum finished calling Child Protective Services, the blonde lady, her gangly teen son and the violent teenage girl were pounding at our door, thirsty for blood. My mother slowly dropped the blinds and eased the windows open a crack, stating that she would not open the door. The nasty woman then proceeds to yell at my mother for not staying out of other people's business and that she should just leave them alone. This went on for almost a half hour before my mum had enough. My mother calmly explained that so long as she had to witness such cruel acts and foul mouths, she wasn't going to stay out of their business, and if they didn't get off her property, she would call the police. She shut the window, closed the blinds, and they kept on their cussing. Not long after, the police were called for similar reasons by our other neighbours, and the family were given a final warning and an eviction date. They stayed weeks after the water and power had been cut. When they realized they had to move out or be arrested, they did everything in their power to destroy and deface the house they were staying in. The landlady was in tears, and she gave my mother a tour of the now vacant house. Windows had been smashed, sinks were ripped out and tossed into the yard, walls were riddled with holes and foul graffiti, toilets were blocked with human waste, and whatever they couldn't take was destroyed. It's been some time, and that same house has now been filled with a new family, but the memory is still fresh. Horrible neighbors, I hope to never meet you again. My mother, my sister and I had a day out a few cities over, so we were all generally in a good mood as we walked by some vandalized buildings to get to the back of the car. I think I may have been the one to spot him first. 
As far as I can remember, he was the only other person around aside from our group. He was dressed for the weather in shorts and a short sleeved shirt and appeared normal. But after he caught sight of us, he almost immediately changed his trajectory towards us. I felt my mother stiffen slightly from where she stood besides me as he approached. Even if the memory wasn't slightly foggy from the passage of time, I still wouldn't be able to make out the things he said. As far as I could tell, he was shouting something about God at my mother before demanding to know if those girls were Catholics. My mother pushed us away from him slightly and stuttered out a response, clearly blindsided by the random question. My sister looked confused but stayed silent, and I took the opportunity to move slightly to the side so that there was more distance between me and this random guy who had shouted about God in my mother's face. The guy then shoved a small package into my sister and mother's hands while ignoring me completely. He shouted something like, that's the word of the Lord on those leaflets there. You better read them or I'll end you both. At that point, I was considering decking him in the face because he had shoved his own face way down close to my sister's to be any sort of comfortable. But my mother pushed her even further back while she hastily voiced her agreement. Seeming satisfied, the man walked off, but not before shouting more random things into my mother's face. She nodded and agreed with whatever he was saying. And as soon as he was out of sight, she placed a hand on both our backs and hurried us along. I remember thinking at the time that the things he had given them were clearly not leaflets. And I was proven right when my mother stopped walking after and we were a good distance away and opened hers. She recoiled and abandoned it and got my sister to do the same. My mother thought it was tobacco, but my sister said it looked more like a particular hair. For being screamed at in her face by a random guy, she was rather nonplussed about the whole thing. As we were leaving the car, our mother caught sight of the same guy having an argument with another man. My sister and I both looked and we got to bear witness as he climbed on top of a car and started stripping. Needless to say, we didn't stay there long after that. My friend and I decided to go on a late night drive to find this creepy cemetery one night. Great start to a story I know, but we were bored and in a small town with nothing else to do. After about 40 minutes of driving, we got to the state park. Now, typically, parks are closed after dark, but these roads were still public access, so they weren't off limits to general drivers. However, we were the only ones on the road at this point, and it was isolated we thought. The lanes were surrounded by thick trees and it was dark. No street lights, kind of dark. We were on a narrow dirt lane looking for this cemetery, but we drive by it unknowingly. The area we were driving through was kind of like a square of roads with only one way in and out. We get to the crossroads where the road we are on goes straight through or you could continue back through by a left turn only. Next to the ditch across the road from us, we see a dark green sedan pulling to the brush. No lights on, no people around, not an accident from all we could tell. Whatever, kind of weird. But we slowly turn left and begin the loop back around looking for the small rows of old headstones again. As we get back around to the intersection about five minutes away, the green sedan is still pulled off in the bushes, but now it's not only the vehicle there. There's a big pickup truck idling in the dark across from us, blocking the straightaway. Now, it had to have come from the other direction since no cars passed us or in front or behind us. That was the way we had planned to go to leave the park since we hadn't found what we had been looking for, but we couldn't pass through. This truck was in the middle of the road, taking up all the space on either side. At first, we were thinking this guy probably got his car stuck and called for help. Then, 
This truck guy turns on his headlights, actually his high beams and begins revving his engine hard. My friend and I exchange looks, like wonder who's overcompensating for something. And when we turn back trying to see through the blinding lights, we see a silhouette of a big bulky man standing in front of the truck, hands on hips just standing there. We aren't but a car's length and a half away from this guy and there's nowhere left to go, which we know just leads us back around to the same place. We sit there staring at each other for a few moments, trying to decide what to do. My friend starts pulling the car forward at snail pace, trying to keep as much distance between us and this truck as possible. And we make it turn left. He's just standing there not moving, just looking in our direction. We weren't scared yet really. But I'm a bit paranoid generally. So I was waiting for him to lunge at the car, throw something at us or something. I don't know. It just really felt off. After we turn, I check the rear view and see the guy holding something as he takes a few steps behind our car in the outline of the light. It's long, barrel shaped and threatening looking. We peel out of there now wanting to put distance between us but forgetting we are stuck in this square of roads. When we get back to about halfway between the start of the straightaway and the truck, whose headlights we can still see, we pull off to the side of the road, trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. I look out the window and see that we are sitting right next to the cemetery we had been looking for, but we are both too freaked out to get out, and we laugh at the irony for a second. Then we see headlights coming from behind us. Oh crap, it's the guy, we think. As it gets closer, we see it's a white SUV and it slows next to our car. The window is rolled down and it's a car full of guys our age. What are you guys up to out here? The driver says. We say that we're just out for a drive and they say some things we can't hear to each other. My friends and I don't have a strong menacing aura, so we hoped we could just send some chill vibes and have them leave us off the hook for whatever was going on. Were they in with the truck guy? Cause this wasn't truck guy, but this just all seemed too weird. We asked if they'd seen a truck up ahead, where they had driven by, but they said that they hadn't. When we looked back, we noticed the lights coming from the oncoming direction were gone. They laughed and pulled away slowly, telling us to have a good night, and we pulled back onto the road to take off for the exit, only looking out the windows for long enough to notice that the sedan was still there. We made it back to his parents' house without further incident and told them about this strange encounter, but couldn't really explain what had happened. It still sounds kind of stupid when I talk about it, but something was going on, still. It could have just been a guy out fixing a car late at night, but why the aggressive behavior? And who were the people in the SUV? And why did they suddenly appear? I'm just glad nothing worse happened. I avoid state parks at night, but my friend, he's still a maniac camping in the woods alone, and he's seen some stuff. The first house that my mum and stepfather bought after they got pregnant with my sister had a few weird things happen. When she got old enough to communicate, she would wake up with a rash on her back, crying about the bees on the ceiling. That was pretty much the extent of what happened in the actual house. But we had a detached garage, probably 30 feet away from the back door of the house. And the garage had a loft that I decorated and hung out in when I was in my early teens. It started when I was jamming to music one day and thought I heard someone come in and being rattled through the toolbox downstairs. I shut my music off and called out to no one there. I turned my music back on a little while later, thinking I was hearing a quiet conversation going on as if someone was on the phone. I turned my music back off and called out again to no one. So I turned on my music quieter and swore I could hear some more rattling and someone opened and closed the door to leave. I packed up my stuff and go into the house to ask around 
and nobody has been in the garage all day but me. I stopped hanging out up there. More and more I got a really eerie feeling about the garage, to the point where I don't like to even have my back to it in broad daylight because it makes me feel strange. Sometime later I was telling my friend about it and he was like, oh my dad has a camera, let's see what happens when we leave the camera there. So in the evening as the sun was setting, he gets his dad's camera and we sit up there facing the front room. In the garage you climb up a ladder in the back of the room, up into a large hole in the floor of the loft and if you look towards the front of the room you can see where the barn doors of the loft crack open and leave in a bit of light. So this is a rectangular little camera that's got nothing fancy about it, very much like the ones that most people own. We have the lights off, set it facing the front and as we descend I take note that there's a little blue light on the back of the camera as it's recording since I've already been tasked with retrieving the camera when we're done, and I want to remember what I'm looking for. So we go and talk with my mum who thinks I'm crazy. 20 minutes later, we go up to fetch the camera and the blue light is gone. What the hell? I reach out and feel for it and realise the camera has rolled over, not even onto its flat screen, but then once more onto its narrow top side to face the back wall of the garage. I grabbed it and bolted faster than I ever had in my life. We watched the recording and sure enough, about five minutes later, after seeing nothing, we then heard a thud and watched the camera seemingly roll over alone with enough momentum to not stop on the wide flat side, but to the next narrow end. We tried to leave the camera up overnight, but his dad came to get it and I never saw the recording again. I grew up in a small town where you wouldn't necessarily know everybody, but you're familiar with people in town. This story happened when I was maybe 15 to 16, so about 15 years ago. I was on my way to practice one Saturday morning when I noticed an older man on the corner ahead staring at me. Being me, I smile and wave at the guy as I pass. Back then I smiled at everyone and then I stop at the same corner waiting to cross. The guy comes right up behind me and I vaguely remember smelling him, feel him breathe on my neck. I'm a bit worried but brush it off as being over reactionary. Light changes and I carry on and this guy speeds up walking behind me mumbling something to get my attention. I must have looked terrified because a woman begins to walk next to me asking if I know the guy. I tell her that I don't and she stays in pace with me and has to go into the local grocery store that we're passing in front of with her. We get to the store and the lady immediately grabs an employee at the register for help. At this point I'm shaking in fear trying to hide behind people standing by the register. They're all discussing something. I'm not sure what because the guy that was following me was just staring at me through the window, making a throat slicing motion and I'm paralyzed. The people at the store gathered around me to make me feel safe, as I'm pretty sure I broke down in tears when he did that. And soon after, the cops came and I watched them arrest him. I don't remember much after that besides my parents picking me up from the store and going to the police station. My dad actually worked as a dispatcher in town at the time and he told me a few days later the guy was off his meds and had been brought into a local psycho hospital for treatment. I never saw the man or the woman who saved me after that. So to my guardian angel, I never got the chance to thank you for protecting me. I was and still am living in Kelowna. British Columbia. At the time I was 17 and living with my mum but working full time. I normally left the house about 4am to walk into work for 4.30. I started my walk like I did every other morning, got myself bundled up, it was during the winter, put my headphones in and started to make my way to work. I get a few houses down from my mum's place and a guy steps out onto the sidewalk. 
He shouts something out at me that I don't quite understand because I had my music in my ears. So I pulled out an earbud and asked him to repeat himself. He looked at me with this wide-eyed look, and I immediately regretted asking him to repeat what he said. Jesus loves you, he says in this creepy sing-song voice. Uh, thanks, I guess. And Jesus wants me to take your life. At this point, my blood ran cold. The street was empty beside us. I was training in martial arts at the time, so I kind of shifted my stance knowing full well I could get my ass kicked, but I still didn't want to show fear. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the pepper spray my mum handed me earlier for when I walked around at such an early hour. I showed it to him and screamed with all that I could to leave me alone. Leave me alone right now, I'm gonna call the cops. Jesus loves you. He said that, half sung, half in a mocking tone, and skipped like an excited child away from me. I walked down the road a bit further and called my parents on the house phone from my cell so that the ring would wake someone up. And when my dad answered, I practically shouted at him to meet me outside with my mum and bring the phone out in case he decided to follow me home. Upon getting there, I called the cops and they told me something similar had happened to a girl my age, and she kept walking. But when she turned the corner, three other guys attacked her and nearly ended her life. Because it was so dark, I couldn't really make out the details about this guy. All that I could tell is that he was high or something. They stayed home for three days and refused to leave my house because it happened not more than three houses down from where I lived. The police couldn't really do anything as I didn't have a description, and they weren't sure if the attackers and taunting Jesus loves you guy were working together, or if it was just unlucky for the previous girl. My house, which I rent, has a ground floor and two more floors, so three in total. I was getting ready to go out, and I went to the first floor, in my room to get my makeup. I went to the second floor in my flatmate's room, to do my makeup there. I go back to my room about 45 minutes later, and I see three of my purses on the floor, and the shoulder handle has been cut on two of them, and a little bit on the third one. Both purses are cut in the same way, in the same spots. I start freaking out a bit because no one was in the house except me and my flatmate, and we've been living together upstairs the whole time. In the living room, which is on the ground floor, we had left the back window open, so the air could ventilate, and we had had some people over the night before. The door in the living room leads to a tiny garden which is protected by a tall fence, which is more protected by a wired fence, and I doubt anyone could have just climbed it and come in cut purses, take no money or cards from either of them, and then leave. The complex has eight flats, so all the tiny gardens are connected in a long line, but we are only connected to one, as we are the last flat in this line. So absolutely nothing was stolen or even moved, and we see no marks anywhere. But it's still weird, so I call the police to find an explanation. They come, checked the evidence, there was a wet spot on the carpet in a room about 5 centimeters long, and how the purses are cut. I thought it was a fox that went in the house, went upstairs, ate the bags and left, based on facts that a fox tried to enter the living room one time, in the same way a few weeks ago. The police said it was not an animal cut, it was most probably a knife cut and asked if we had any problems with anyone like an ex or something. We do not. Most people do not even know where I live, and especially how to get to one's room, as the house is pretty complicated. The stairs in the house are metal and spiralled, and you basically hear it from every spot in the house if someone is on the stairs. Police call forensics to ask for advice, and they say they do not know what they could do as they can't take fingerprints off the bags because of the texture, 
and the wet spot is apparently dry now. Police say they've never heard of anything like it, and it makes no sense. They marked it off as a burglary and left. I have to mention that the night to morning before, we had the music pretty loud, and one neighbor texted us very angrily to stop it. I mean, he knows the house as we have the same structure. He was the only one with access, but he's like 75 years old, and all the encounters we had were really nice so far. So we were left with something or someone that comes to the house through the back garden that's protected by a very high wall and wired fence, comes through the living room, passes by the PS4, TV, expensive speakers, goes onto the hallway, passes very expensive shoes, goes up the stairs, enters a bedroom, cuts the handle to the purses, doesn't take anything and then just leaves. I slept in my flatmate's room that night, and today I went into my room to clean it up, and I found one of the missing handle pieces in my bed, under the blanket. What the hell is going on? I have no explanation for any of this, and simply wish I did. I grew up for the most part in an Australian city, but lived with my grandmother in a small country town in rural Australia for a while. This town was about a 25 minute drive away from a larger country town that we did all our major shopping in once a week or so. We go into this town to do some clothes shopping and pull up into the shopping center car park which directly connected to the entrance of the center with the closest car park only a few meters away from the entryway. 10 meters from that entrance, there was another entryway to a standalone store. The store was quite large with many aisles and the cash registers right near the entrance on the left side of the door. We'd finished our shopping in the main center and had gone into the other store to do some shopping. And my grandmother noticed a man who would come in not long after us and was floating around the entrance, looking in very suspiciously. We were in an aisle about 10 meters from where he was and me being the young oblivious kid I was, didn't notice him and just continued to look at different shirts for sale. I moved further up the aisle, and every step that I took closer to the end, he inched a little closer towards us. I didn't notice this, but I remember my grandmother walking up to me and putting her arm around my shoulder and telling me to stay right next to her. I remember looking at an item and asking my grandmother how much it was, as I couldn't see a price tag. So I asked if I could go ask the cashier. She reluctantly agreed, but told me to walk straight to the counter and back. As I walked to the counter, he moved even closer to me. It was just left of the door, perhaps five meters from the guy. And I'm guessing he thought I was walking towards the exit as I only changed my direction right as I got to the counter. All of a sudden, he grabbed me by my left arm and tried to pull me towards him. But as I just changed direction towards the counter, he wasn't able to get a good enough grip of me and I pulled away quickly. He looked so startled and shocked that he just ran straight out the door and into a car just outside and pulled away. That was it. No number plate, no police, no nothing. My grandma grabbed me and we left. I can't help but think, what if this wasn't his first time? What if he succeeded after me? Or if I'd heard stories of children going missing before and after that, that he was responsible for? Did he spot me while we were shopping earlier and wait for the best opportunity to try it? I hate to think what could have happened and what may have happened after that day. But creepy guy, I now have a baseball bat and I hope to not meet you again.
I'm a 22 year old female. And this happened back when I was around 14. I was a freshman in high school and I lived in Georgia. Every year in the fall, the fair comes to town. They have fun rides, booths where you can win prizes and really good fair food everywhere. I usually go with my family, but this year I was gonna meet up with my boyfriend and hang out with him and his friends. I arrive with my family and text my boyfriend to meet up. When I find him in the crowd, he pulled me aside and broke up with me. What a place to get dumped, right? Anyway, this was the end of the world to my 14 year old self. And I definitely didn't want to return to my family. I was all alone and decided to sit down at a picnic table and cry. I had my head down and nobody was around me until this man approached. This man was older, 50 to 60 ish, a white overweight male, stereotypical carny looking worker. He sits down at the table I'm at right next to me and starts asking what's wrong. Now I was a late bloomer. So when I was 14, I probably looked closer to 12. Being so upset, I told him that my boyfriend had just broken up with me. He puts his hands on my shoulder and tells me that he was sorry and he would never dump me if he was with me. I didn't reply. He then tells me that he runs a booth over in the furthest corner of the fairground. And if I went to that booth, he would give me a free stuffed animal. He told me the type of booth he ran, but I can't remember what it was. Something like the water guns or something. He pointed me to where the booth was, which ended up being a really secluded corner. I said thanks and that I might find him later. He exits. I get myself together, wipe the tears up and go find my family again. We had a systematic way of going to every part of the fair to make sure that we got a good chance to ride everything. I walk around the entire fairground looking at every booth, especially the water gun one, and I never saw him. He was definitely not working one of them because I would have seen his face and remembered him. I really wanted a stuffed animal. So I was disappointed that I never did find him. I never told my mum about it because I was really embarrassed to be dumped at the fair. Looking back on it now, I realized the dangerous situation that it could have led to. This man tried to lure me to a secluded corner of the fair to do God knows what. I'm glad I never got to see him. When I was a sophomore in high school, a friend would drive me home. One day we went to a record store with two other friends and on the way back to drop me off, this guy in a truck passed us, narrowly missing our car and oncoming traffic, and we decided it'd be fun to follow him for a bit. So he turns onto another road shortly after and immediately pulls up to a mailbox and starts retrieving his mail. As we pass him, all four of us flip him off out the window and continue driving down the road. About half a mile later, we see the same vehicle driving insanely fast behind us. He tailgates us for a bit and we start to panic a little. We start to slow down for a stop sign and the guy whips around and cuts us off, slamming on his brakes in front of us. We wait for the moment and he steps out of his car with a crowbar. We drive around him, but there's a stop sign in front of us. We had to briefly pause at. The guy run towards my door and grabs it when my friend takes off. We're flying down the road, hoping to lose him. We make another turn onto a really busy street and think we've lost him and we turn again and drive normally for a few miles. At this point, we're convinced we're safe. We pull up to another intersection and are waiting in the right turn lane. We look behind us and two or three cars away is the same dude in the turning lane, flashing his headlights on and off. We make our turn and speed down the road, but so does the other guy. He speeds around us and slams on his brakes, forcing us to stop. We try and go around him, but he keeps maneuvering so we can't do that. Eventually we stop and I say something stupid like, maybe he just wants to talk to us. So he's straddling both lanes of the road, gets out of his car with his crowbar in hand and a terrifying look on his face. My friend drives off the road, gets around the dude and we speed away. Of course he does the same and is driving like a maniac, but so are we. And we maintain a bit of lead on him. 
We make another turn and there's a school bus in front of us, just about to stop. We speed around it just in time for the bus's stop sign to extend. And for some reason, the dude actually stops behind it and we speed off. We were close to another friend's house, so we pull into their driveway and into the open garage. We're all terrified at this point, so we run inside and watch out the window for this guy. He drives past the house, but thank goodness we were parked in the garage, so he didn't see the car. Moral of the story, don't mess with people. They may be crazy. I had recently gotten a job and had more money than I was used to having. So of course, being the fiscally irresponsible 18 year old I was, I was constantly online looking at Amazon and Groupons and just anything to spend my money on. I found a Groupon for a local pizza slash game place just outside of the county of OKC, kind of like a Dave and Buster's, but with a pizza and dessert buffet, among other party place food items. The food was right past the hostess counter on the left, and to the right was a room with chairs and booths and anything to eat at. Typical arcade eatery things. Walking past the food and dining area was the huge back area with the games and a small roller coaster. I went with my older sister, who didn't seem incredibly into the place, but was content to hang out with me and just spend time together. Looking back, if I had a license, I may not have gone with her, and I shudder to think what would have happened. After playing the games, we could and found interesting. She wanted to sit down and eat. We had gone on this simulated roller coaster ride with the double plastic seats and a screen in front of them, the kind that shakes and tilts and gives kids a good time without giving their parents a heart attack on a real roller coaster. She joined me for one of the simulated experiences and said that she felt sick from it. It's understandable since it's very jerky and our mum has vertigo, most likely passing it down to us. But I wanted to do the rest because it was the most fun we had since we went in. She said I could by myself, but she was gonna grab a plate and wait for me. I don't know what made me get back up, but as soon as she left, I really didn't want to be alone. I'd gotten lost before as a young child in a similar place, so I figured I was just being socially anxious and paranoid as normal. Even though nothing was wrong, I still didn't like being alone in public because I'm just over five feet, barely over a hundred pounds and look much, much younger. I got up, found her at the buffet, about to sit down and hurried to grab a plate and a slice of pizza and a few sweet things. Shortly after we sit down and start eating, a young woman sits next to me. And luckily for her, I'm on the passive end. And while I'm incredibly uncomfortable, I shift over to give her room, mostly just to distance myself from her because I always try to keep my boundaries and don't like people touching me. If she had tried that stuff on my sister, she would have not budged an inch and probably even bumped her off. If it wasn't weird enough, that this weird lady sat down next to me, she started acting like she knew us, saying stuff like, I can't believe you guys left me back there. I was calling you. Wow, Erin, why are you ditching us? All the while laughing like we tried to pull a joke on her and she saw through it. My sister looks at me. Do you know her? Even though she's 100% sure that I don't, she just wants to establish we aren't friends and maybe she mistook us for them in some way. I shake my head. Okay, who the hell are you, woman? I'm sorry, but we don't know you. Please sit elsewhere, my sister said. Her words polite, but in a matter of fact tone. I should also mention, my sister practically raised me because we had a single mum who, if she wasn't working to support us, was going out on dates to try and find Mr. Wright. So my sister is amazingly protective of me and an absolute rock star when it comes to weirdos trying to make me feel uncomfortable. And she knows of my social anxiety and boundary issues. So this whole situation is not okay. Don't be silly, we went to high school together, this woman says. Still trying to insist, we simply forgot her. This raises huge red flags for my sister. 
because we moved around a lot from a young age and almost never stayed in the same place for over a year. Not to mention my sister attended high school in Hawaii, Oklahoma, and Louisiana, and I attended the same school in Hawaii and a school in Missouri, and two others in Oklahoma. We both attended the same high school a few years apart in a very small town, so small that even people in neighboring areas hadn't heard of it. The school that I uniquely went to was in a smallish town and I dropped out when I was 18 because they were racist and sexist amongst other things. I stay quiet, my sister getting annoyed. What was the name of the school? My sister asks, knowing she'll never say the name of the school we attended. Oh, you know, we went together. We even had a few classes. Don't you remember me? She said her name was Bunny and neither of us knew anyone personally with that name. No, I don't remember you. Which school was it so I can try and remember? My sister pressed and the woman kept saying that we should remember her and tried to avoid the question. My sister then got fed up. You need to leave. We don't know you, you're making us uncomfortable. And after a bit more of trying to convince us we were wrong, she got up, huffed off through the door that looked to be employees only. And I didn't get close enough to see if it was the case, but the bathrooms were on the other side and no one went near that door, save a few staff. It was a strange occurrence. We finished eating and considered telling the security guards, but since she was already gone and nothing actually happened, we shrugged it off and went home, not feeling like sticking around in case she was lingering. Writing this gave me horrible feelings looking back. If I'd been more independent and got my license and went alone, or if I'd have stayed at that ride and she pushed herself next to me, and tries to force conversation, I would have been too awkward to say anything and might have let her go too far. What could her intentions have been? My sister feared she might be a scout for traffickers or something because she kept repeating the same lines and looking around. Perhaps she genuinely thought that we had gone to school together, but in that case, why could she not say the name? I think it's just too odd of a situation to completely discount the fact that it could have had a very nefarious intention behind it. Before I begin, I should state this was a few years ago. I'm a tiny woman. I, at the time, looked like a teenager, and I've always been mindful that I am an easier target. I had seen a job interview for a small business looking for a secretary. No experience needed, as they would provide on-the-job training, and that was kind of a thing I was looking for. I applied. I heard back quickly and was invited to an interview. When I arrived, I was excited. It was a bit of a journey from my home, but it was in a beautiful old building on the third floor with a modern layout inside, though you could tell it was very new, as it was bare bones and very little had been unpacked. Still though, if you have to work somewhere, might as well be a nice building, right? The interview seemed lovely. I only encountered female members of staff and they were all warm and lovely. The woman interviewing me was amazing and even sat talking to me for a while after just getting to know me. When I got home, I wasn't in the door long before I got a phone call from them. I nailed the interview. Awesome. I thought I was offered the job, I was about to accept when I was told on the phone, okay, you'll come here tomorrow and we'll have a van drive you to where you're gonna be working. I was confused. What did they mean? They then told me I'd be meeting with customers on their behalf and talking and selling stuff. I was not comfortable with this as this wasn't what I was interviewed for, but I gave them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they had a second position they thought I would fit in better with. I thought it wouldn't be that weird, as a new company and while not that I was comfortable with it, I should at least hear them out. So I ask more questions and the woman on the other end of the line is getting more snippy and tense. The friendliness now gone, and she wouldn't reveal who I would be going with or where. By this point, so many red flags had popped up, I said no thanks and respectfully declined the offer. 
For anyone curious about what happened after, I reported this as it seemed very dodgy. But when they were checked in on the floor, it was no longer occupied. They'd apparently just rented it for a week and were gone. I grew up in the suburbs of Charlotte, North Carolina. My parents bought a house from the 70s, complete with colorful toilets, pink and periwinkle, and lots of vibrant wallpaper. The house was not open concept in the slightest, with four doors to the outside, two staircases, and with many easy storage places and walls one could hide behind without someone in the next room having any idea where they were. The house has always creeped me out, even though we now have normal white toilets. One day, my brother and I left for school and my dad left for work, leaving my mum alone to get ready for work. While in the kitchen, she heard the electric pencil sharpener going off upstairs, as if someone was sharpening a pencil, on and off repeatedly for several minutes. She hauled us out the house and called the sheriff to investigate. The sheriff walked through the entire house, checking every little crevice behind every wall for signs of an intruder. When he got to the office, he noticed the storage closet that was never used was wide open, and there were the freshly sharpened pencils sitting on the desk. He couldn't explain what he saw, but it would be extremely easy for someone to slip in and out of one of the various entrances without anyone knowing. Things got even weirder when a few days later, my mum and I found another perfectly sharpened pencil in the passenger seat of her car. This all happened 11 years ago, and the weird pencil finding stopped there. But we are still convinced someone was stalking my mum, and we have dubbed this person the Pencil Man, and blame him whenever something goes missing, or isn't where it should be. For background, my family moved to the countryside from the city when I was about seven, and I'm 21 now. Both my parents had grown up in the suburbs and had lived in the capital of our state for about 10 years before we moved. It definitely took us some time to get used to the train tracks that ran by our house, the wild animals, the weird but kind neighbors, and the odd visitors. Another thing is that you have to get off the main road and turn onto a long gravel driveway to get to our house. We can see the entire length of driveway from certain points in our yard, which is about three acres. A few years after we moved, my dad got a promotion at work, and as a result started to get conferences and business trips that lasted from a few days to weeks, at least a few times a year. My mum felt very nervous about being home alone with two young kids, I was 10 and my brother was six, so we decided to get a dog. We knew we wanted a big dog, but something that would be gentle with my brother and I. After a few weeks at looking at shelters, we took home Rocky. He was nine months when we took him home, and already pushing 70 pounds. We believe he's a German Shepherd mixed with some Northern or mountain breed. We aren't sure to this day, but he's a massive red colored dog with a long black muzzle and ears, a fluffy tail that he carries over his back, and a white stripe up his nose. It wasn't long until he was a hundred pounds and an absolute force to be reckoned with. Even though he was very gentle with both my brother and I, loved our cats and was a big ball of joy to be around, anyone we brought into the house, he tended to be very territorial and aggressive with other dogs and very protective of us, especially of my mum and I. Once the electric company came to do work on the telephone poles on our property without telling us first, and after 20 minutes, they finally had to call us because Rocky had trapped them in their truck and was jumping up and barking at their window. I doubt he would have really attacked them if they'd have left their trucks, but it was more than enough to make them think twice. This protective instinct came in very, very handy one day. It was summertime, my dad was at work, and my mum was home with my brother and I since she was a teacher and off for the summer with us. My mum was working in our garden and my brother and I were playing close by with Rocky watching over all of us. Rocky all of a sudden sounded the alarm, throwing his head up in the air and barking as he makes a deep woo woo noise. I looked up to see a dirty white pickup truck off the main road into our driveway. This wasn't necessarily alarming at first, 
as people sometimes used our driveway to turn around when they got lost. But the white pickup slowly ambled up our drive, and I could see something strange in the bed. It was lumpy and discoloured, but I couldn't really tell what it was until he pulled all the way up to our house, where our other cars were, and honked the horn to get our attention. It was meat. Giant red chunks of meat with some limbs of various animals still attached. It was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Just a grizzled, scraggly man in his early 50s driving a pickup truck full of meat in the southern July heat. I immediately just got a really bad vibe from the guy, and I remember my mum telling my brother and I to go inside, and we did, but watched out the glass door. Rocky had surprisingly been quiet at that point, but was now next to my mum, and she had her hands around his collar. The guy rolled down the window and asked my mum if she wanted to purchase some quality meat. My mum said no, and to never visit our property again. Instead, he went on about the different types of meat and asking how much we wanted, beef, venison, pork, etc. My mum asked him to leave again, but instead he decided to get out of the nasty white pickup. As soon as his feet touched the ground, Rocky went ballistic, barking and snarling. This finally made the guy stop. He looked at Rocky, looked at my mum and asked, does your dog bite? My mum, deathly serious, replied, only if I tell him to. The guy took one more look at Rocky, and I'm guessing decided not to mess with the giant snarling beast, got into his truck, backed up, and headed back down our driveway. I don't know if he was just trying to sell the meat or what, but apparently he'd been around to our neighbours, who also had just gotten a really bad vibe from him. We'll never know what he was really doing with those giant slabs of meat in the bed of his pickup truck. Maybe he was just a weird guy out to sell some sketchy meat. Maybe he was looking for something else, but we never saw the meat man again. Rocky is still kicking it, by the way. He's almost 15 and completely deaf, but he's still out on the yard on summer days, watching over us. I live in Melbourne, and at the time I was living in a small flat near a popular street called Chapel Street that has a pretty busy nightlife. My flat was located about 100 metres off a main road, just behind a police station, a five minute walk away from the street, and due to this I always felt relatively safe walking home alone from Chapel, after a big night out. So in order to tell this story, I have to go back a few months before the incident. I regularly shopped at the Woolworths just up the road from me, and was approached by a Jamaican man one day after walking home from getting groceries. He began talking to me. He told me that he had seen me a few times at the supermarket, and had always wanted to say hello. I was flattered, and we struck up this innocent conversation about what it was like growing up in small towns and moving to a big city like Melbourne. He insisted on walking me home. This was a foolish mistake. I felt a bit uncomfortable about this, but didn't want to come off as rude, so I figured I would just wait till he was out of sight to go inside so that he wouldn't know which flat I lived in, as there were eight in total. He seemed like a nice guy, and when we reached my building I said goodbye, and he asked for my number. I didn't really want to give it to him, as I was already seeing someone, but I figured maybe he was just looking to make friends in the area. He messaged me the next day, asking me to take me out on a date, and I politely declined and told him I had a boyfriend. That was the last I saw of him. At least, I thought. Fast forward seven months, and I'm walking home at 1.30am from a bar on Chapel Street. As I'm walking home, I see a guy in the distance walking towards me. I thought to myself, hmm, he looks familiar. As he got closer, I realised it was the Jamaican guy again. Just a weird coincidence, I thought. When he reached me, I said hello and expressed my surprise at bumping into him. This is when things begin to get really uncomfortable. 
He began telling me how he was at a bar with his friend when he saw me walk past. His friend, after discovering he knew me, told him to stop being such a baby and go talk to me. So this guy had jumped into his car, driven around the corner down the road and parked up ahead in order to catch me. This made me feel uneasy. Come have a drink with me, he said. I've already been out, I'm heading home, it's late. I really wanna just go to sleep. Sorry. No, come on, come have a drink. He grabbed my hand. I gently pulled away and said, I'm really not interested in drinking anymore. I want to go home. Please come for a drink. This little dance went on for a good five minutes with him continually grabbing my hand and pulling me away. I thought he would get the hint. Then he changed his tactics. Let me walk you home. No, thank you. He argued this with me for a while, then started repeating, but I know where you live. I don't know how he thought this would magically make me trust him. It only succeeded in freaking me out. And at one point, I remember him saying, screw the police. I can't remember the exact context of this statement though. We argued for a good 15 to 20 minutes before I gave in, a little worried what would happen to me if I flat out told him to piss off. And he ended up walking with me. As we were nearing my building, I had decided I really should say something to get him to leave before he saw which flat I was in. Just as I was about to talk, he said he should go back to his friend. I was completely relieved, but still shaken. He asked for my number again, and I didn't want to say no because I knew he wouldn't take it. And I didn't know if he would get aggressive. If I gave him a fake one, he could test it out before I left. I have had that happen in the past. So I complied, and as soon as he was out of sight, I ran to my flat, locked the door, and proceeded to check all the windows were secured. I lived with a boy who worked in the casino and was hoping that he would be home that night. I was very upset to find out he was not, and I called my housemate terrified and told him what had happened and asked when he would be home. He told me he wouldn't be back for another four hours due to night shift and to call the police if he came back knocking on the door. The guy messaged me about an hour after, saying how good it was to see me again, and then text me in the morning too. After calming down and gathering my strength, I replied to him, saying that the way he had approached me had made me quite uncomfortable, and that I would appreciate being left alone. Haven't heard from him since, he's probably not a dangerous guy, I just hope he learnt not to approach women that way after our encounter. It may not sound like much of an ordeal to you, but if you'd have been there and seen everything from your own eyes, you'd have been pretty terrified as well. Where I work, it's hard to avoid people. My job is to document everyone else's work by taking photos, so a lot of people know me generally as the blonde photo girl. While shooting an event a few months ago, I found myself talking to a group of people about hobbies. I, being the anime trash that I am, mentioned conventions. This one small creepy stashed dude got all excited and said he's going to Comic-Con. I thought he was talking about the official ones, so I asked, NYC or San Diego? He said some random town in Ohio. And I said, well, it's probably not an official Comic Con. And he got really flustered about this and proceeded to follow me around, just saying over and over, it's a real Comic Con. At this point, I'm annoyed as hell. I'm getting the vibes that one, he's a creep, and two, he's just using this as an excuse to follow me around. I tell him, hey, this conversation was over when I walked away. Why are you still hung up on it? He looked so butthurt, and he said, but it was Comic-Con. Cue earlier this week. During a break, a friend and I did a little PS Vita game trading. When we were wrapping things up, I noticed the same freaking kid at another table watching. I barely think of it, and stand up and say bye to my friend. That kid had stood up too and walked slowly to the vending machines, which I had to pass by to get to my workspace. 
By the time I was nearing him, he was idly standing in front of a machine, just glancing at me in the machine, not moving to buy anything either. I thought, oh great, let me guess, he's gonna follow me. And I tested this by going to the store past the vending machine and down some stairs. Lo and behold, five seconds later, he's following. And since there are no jackets allowed in store, I set this empty soda can down that I had from earlier on the ground so that I can take off my coat. He meagerly offers. I think they have a garbage bag in the store. And I reply with a little attitude. Duh, there's a trash can in there. And here's where I finally decide to vent and tell him how creepy it was that he'd followed me. I didn't follow you, he says with the guiltiest look on his face. I shut him down and I was like, yeah, sure, I'm gonna go now. That was the last thing I said, and then I was done with that guy. I really hope he doesn't decide to pester me anymore. Creep. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 24 year old female and probably couldn't defend myself from a 10 year old. I went to the grocery store to pick up some things the other night. When I got to the register, there was a man helping me bag my groceries while the cashier was checking me out. I was buying some dog treats and he asked me what kind of dog I had. I said, a golden doodle. And he said, oh my gosh, me too. I didn't really get an off vibe from him, but he would stare and not break eye contact at all. I chalked it up to him missing social cues and trying to be friendly. After I paid, he started pushing the cart for me out the door. This isn't uncommon, as they typically help you take your things to the car. I have social anxiety and feel very awkward and guilty for them having to do that for me. So I always told them that I'm good and thank you. And every other time they've said, okay, have a good one. When I gave my usual reply to this guy, he said, nope, I got it, very bluntly, and stared at me the entire time. I instantly got a bad vibe from him. It was about eight at night and barely anyone was there. He said, well, my shift's over, so I'm walking to my car now anyway. Weird because he didn't clock out, but maybe he had before he did this last checkout. He was very talkative in the store, asking tons of questions about my dog and telling me about his. But when we got outside, he barely said anything. I started asking questions about his dog because I felt anxious with the silence, but I really regret that. He took it as an interest and immediately said, well, if you give me your number, you can meet him. And just stared yet again. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't give my number to strangers. I don't want to say no because I have a boyfriend because he seemed like he might get angry over that. When we loaded all the groceries in my trunk, I was thinking, thank goodness, I can get out of here now. But no, the cart was between me and him and he was positioned on the driver's side. So in order to get to my door, I would have to go past him. Well, I got to get home. My dog's waiting for his treats. He just stared. I realized I was gonna have to go past him if I wanted to leave. So I looked around to see if anyone else was in the parking lot in case something more happened. No one. I started to get extremely nervous. He could push the cart into me or just grab me himself. I've had this traumatic experience before and my problem is that I don't have a fight or flight. I just kind of freeze. Just like that, he starts walking away, pushing the car to where they are returned in the parking lot. I take the chance to get into the car and lock the doors immediately. I wish I left then, but I needed a moment to breathe and I saw in my side mirror him getting into his car. I quickly put the car in drive and drove out. The exit is a stoplight and just my luck it's red and turning left. I see his car right behind mine not 30 seconds later. I panicked, but then I thought he said he's going home. It's nothing. I only live two minutes from the grocery store. I made the turn and he was hanging back. I didn't put my blinkers on for the next turn. He made it too. 
The next turn was a stoplight, and then the turn for my road. As I get to the light, it's red again. I thought maybe I should drive to a police station just in case. But as soon as that thought came in to my head, the light went green. My boyfriend and I only moved here two months ago, so I didn't think in my head how to get to the station, as I'm terrible at using my phone while driving, and I'm not even 30 seconds from the last turn onto our street. Our street is a dead end with only four houses on it. It's very long and we were at the end. No one goes down it unless they live there or are lost. I turn and he makes the turn. I literally just directed him to my house. Thankfully, I have Bluetooth and called my boyfriend. I said, a guy from the grocery store is following me. Turn on all the lights, open the gates and let Nike out. Nike is his German shepherd and he was trained to be a German police dog and then got extra bite training. He can hold someone for up to six hours. So now knowing he was outside, I wasn't nervous. I was nervous that my boyfriend wouldn't have gotten the gate open in time and I would have to either sit in my car or get out fast and put the code in. As I pulled in, I saw the gate was open and my boyfriend was on the front porch with Nike on a leash and has his firearm in the air. I fly through and down the driveway and this guy follows. Does he not see the firearm and guard dog? Well, he did at that moment because my boyfriend let Nike go and he charges the guy's car. He jumped up at the driver's window, frothing at the mouth, showing all his teeth and the hair on the back standing up. He looked terrifying even to me, and he was protecting me. I gave Nike his command to come back, hoping this guy got the hint that if he guts out of the car, he's going to perish. And hint he got. He reversed the car so damn fast out the driveway, he nearly hit the gate. I collapsed on the front porch and hugged my boyfriend. Nike got steak for dinner, and I reported the man at the grocery store because I remembered his name on his name tag purposefully. They later contacted me that he had been served his termination papers. This happened some years ago. When I had the iPhone 4S, I was laying in bed when I received a phone call. I forget who exactly it was or what exactly they claimed to be offering, but it was fairly obviously a scam of some sort. Well, not obviously enough. This lady was asking me for various details of personal information, which I was giving for some reason. I believe I've read about how people are willing to give up all sorts of information as long as they are asked by someone with the illusion of power or something like that. I was readily handing out my name, email address, confirming my phone number, and it wasn't until she asked for my home address that my common sense kicked in. I didn't need this lady or anyone affiliated with her making house calls, or even so much as sending me garbage mail. Why do you need my address? I asked. So I can process you, she replied. It sounded reasonable. It even made sense assuming she was claiming to be doing whatever it was legitimately but I no longer had the blind faith to hand out any information in hopes that it was. My exact location was pretty much the last detail I was still hanging on to, and I had now decided not to relinquish it. Nothing too creepy had happened yet. Obviously, just politely, I declined and hung up. Well, that was where I ran into trouble. Now she was literally using my name every time she said something to me. After I said nothing to her last statement, she repeats, can I have your address please, Sakura? I say nothing, take my phone away from my head and tap the in call button on screen, but nothing happens. The touch screen is now completely unresponsive. I'm unable to end my call. I vaguely know how easy it would have been not too long previously had I kept my cool as hell Motorola Razor. Still not saying anything, I hold the lock button until the slide to power off option appears. 
Of course, my touch screen is still unresponsive, so this was not a solution after all. Thinking back on it now, I could have just kept holding the lock screen button until the phone would have force powered off. But I guess I wasn't aware of that feature at the time. I had experienced this stupid unresponsive touchscreen issue before and during phone calls. This wasn't the first time I was unable to end phone calls on my own, but I knew that once the call was ended by the other person, the touchscreen functionality would return. But typically the person I'm talking to isn't completely intent on keeping me on there until I relinquish all my secrets. I continued to say nothing. Not only had I decided to not give up my address, but I wasn't even going to give away any more of my voice. So I lay the phone on my bed near me and buried my head in the pillow waiting for her to give up and end the call. But she didn't. I could still hear her a short distance away. Give me your address, Sakura. I ignored her and stayed laying there. What is your address, Sakura? I've been silent for a while now. Any normal person would have likely given up on the conversation, but not this she witch. She still repeated her question, and I searched my brain for a solution. I found one. It's a fairly last resort. I take a trick from my experience jailbreaking my eye device. I seize my phone, which is still transmitting an attempt to ascertain my location and hold the lock and home button until my phone is put in DFU mode. This essentially bricks it temporarily. I guess you put your phone in this mode when you are recovering your device, as well as for some jailbreaks. Finally, my link to this woman was severed. I brought my phone back from the DFU mode and everything was fine after that. I wondered if she somehow had the ability to disable ending the phone call. I now figure it was just a coincidence that the unresponsive touchscreen glitch happened during the call. That's about it though. It was just a really creepy situation to be in, laying there in the dark, being unable to hang up on her, and her repeating the need for my address over and over. I never got another phone call about it, never so much as an email. Maybe it wasn't a scam and I missed the chance of a lifetime. However, judging by her willingness to talk to thin air for a few minutes, I doubt it. My best friend and I went to see Star Wars Episode 7 with her cute brother. They were super close and eventually we got to all hanging out as much as we could. We were all dressed up tastefully as grown adults. My bestie toted a Jedi look. Her brother pulled off a solid hand solo and I pulled off a close and well done Ray, minus the hair. None of us broke bank. We went to the theater and had a blast. It was the first or second night of showing, so it was slammed, and we probably got out just before midnight. I carpooled back to my bestie's apartment where I took my car to go home, as I live about 20 minutes from her place. It was about a quarter past midnight when it happened. I was about five minutes from her house, when within a split second of registering, a white blob came from nowhere and slammed into my windshield. Whatever it was splashed across the entire windshield because it was so large. For some reason, the lights were off for that section of the street. The only real lighting offered by the vibrant gas station lighting a minute back. Shaken up, I couldn't see through my windshield but I was afraid to stop and I couldn't see to turn around and get to the world gas station. The best option I had was to crawl slowly and prayed I hit nothing. I was coming up to a cement median, so I used that as a guide through my driver window. The windshield wiped enough after a solid minute or two of running the wipers continuously. I hit the red stoplight at the end of the strip, where I promptly texted my bestie that I'd been hit by something that impacted my vision, where she promptly offered to send her brother right away. The white stuff was cleared off my windshield significantly better, so I was okay driving home. Because of where I was and the fact the light was out, there were no cameras. I didn't think of calling the police, 
or that it could have done any good. When the blob came out of nowhere, I couldn't remember if I was by any vehicles or not. I was so tired from spending the day with them and getting out of that movie late to where I still don't know half of what happened. I know it took a few weeks for some of those spots to wash off the glass. I told my mum in the morning who freaked out and told me that I should have called the cops. Apparently when the windshield fluid was cleaning the white stuff off my window, it actually made it worse. This was an ongoing trend for gang initiations to do things like this to victims. I called them and logged a report and roughly when it happened, but never heard from them again. Another tactic was laced paper with narcotics that make you pass out from touching. It. In any case, I learnt my lesson. Always call the police when something weird happens to you. Oh, and if you get hit with white stuff, do not use the windshield fluid on it. This happened 24 years ago and isn't story I share often. My friend Mike and I are at a bar one night with a friend of ours. We're there with our friend Art, an older guy, and we've known him for a few years from hanging out in clubs. We're in our early 20s, and Art is in his mid 30s or so. But hey, we're all having fun and trying to pick up chicks, so age isn't an issue with us. The night comes to a close, and Art asks us if we want to go to a party with him in Westchester. It's about a 30 to 40 minute drive from where we are, but in the opposite direction of home. There's no guarantee of how big or fun this party would be. So we politely declined and headed to the after hours spot near our house. Fast forward a few days, we read about a girl going missing out in West Chester. We joke and say, thank God we weren't out there and let the news pass. Fast forward another two years, an arrest is made concerning the missing girl. The girl, Amy Willard. Her life was taken from her and her body was discovered a few days after she went missing. This story made every headline in the area and I believe got some national attention. In fact, the show Forensic Files did an episode about it. The murderer, Arthur Bomar. The same art that Mike and I were hanging with the night her life was ended. Had we gone with him to Westchester, it is possible that we either would be in jail with him or worse. I wouldn't be here sharing this experience if that were the case. See, Art ended the life of a man in Nevada and served 11 years for it. When paroled in 1990, he moved out to PA and he was arrested for breaking and entering in 1998. And when apprehended, he was driving the car of a woman named Maria Gambuenos, whose remains were found in March of 1988. And her life and how it ended remains an unsolved mystery and still is to this day. They linked his DNA to the Willard case and conviction. He still sits on death row to this day, I believe. 